Soviet scientists are baffled by photographs of the surface of Mars, taken by the space probe Phobos as it traveled over the planet's equator. The pictures show an inexplicable pattern of lines on the planet's surface, which one British scientist has said look like an aerial view of Los Angeles. That's all for now. More news later. This is pretty significant news. Uh, for a long time, we've known that Mars uh, could foster life, uh, could have done it in the past. Now, what we have evidence of is is what we we think could actually be life. So we're moving along on the on the spectrum here towards uh, definitive proof. So he was showing me how all this worked and. We walked over to one side of the lab and he said, by the way, we've discovered a base on the back side of the moon. And I said, I said, whose? <laughs> the discovery of more water than was first thought on the moon. NASA said today a significant source of water was found when it deliberately crashed a rocket into the lunar surface last month. There has been other evidence of water on the moon, but NASA says this is the best evidence yet. He said, yes, there's, we've discovered a base on the back side of the moon. And at that point, I beca became frightened and I was a little terrified, thinking to myself that if anybody walks in the room now, I know we're, we're in jeopardy, we're in trouble, because he shouldn't be giving me this information. Okay, on this photograph, I want you to just take in the landscape. Okay, I want you to take in the landscape of what you see here. Now I want you to look, focus in on this area right here. I want you to look at this area here, and I want you to compare it to the rest of the landscape. Just focus your eyes for a minute. Okay, I want you to focus on this area, and then the rest of the landscape. What's unusual about this area right here? Yeah. Anything else? Maybe the way these things are all lined up together, right. nice and neat, and, and then these structures right back here. NASA decided just a few years, short years ago from estimates, estimates mind you, that there are 400 billion stars in our galaxy alone. Beyond those two figures of 400 billion stars and 400 billion galaxies, they have said, at the modest minimum, we estimate that there are probably a hundred million planets with intelligent life out there. And now, think about it for a moment. hundred million planets with intelligent life how many of those are well beyond us can you imagine what a planet with intelligence that's a thousand a hundred thousand a million years ahead of us in science that we would think of them as gods would we not if they come here and show themselves and interrelate with us our ancestors did Everybody, welcome back to this. Well, this is the second episode of this new series that we're doing, Mars Chronicles. Good to see you, Josh. Welcome. We got Josh Reed here from redpills.tv. This is a collaborative podcast and research project. Both Josh and I have been really interested in these types of subjects for a long time. 
we wanted to come on here and compare notes and and uh, feel free to drop your comments in the chat. Interesting stuff. I uh, put that little clip together just to weave some of the old school videos that I grew up watching. You know, Bob Dean, Alex Collier, um, you know, the greats who go back and have introduced this subject to the world. And uh, so, yeah, anything that kind of pinged you there, Josh, in that intro? Well, I actually, Dave, good to see you. Um, glad to be here. Um, the the Mars Chronicles, obviously, we've only done one episode, but uh, this is definitely <laughs> this is definitely needed, and it's a good time, as well as it allows us to expand our investigatory nature and look at some things that really have been talked about for decades in the communities that we've been in and shed some new light onto them with things that we knew, know and uh, looking back at a lot of the, the claims that a lot of people have said. Um, one there, I just remember Bob Dean said, there's a hundred million planets out there with intelligent life when looking at that. And um, what I think he meant to say is that's suspected, I believe, just in the Milky Way galaxy is that estimate actually goes about a hundred million Earth-like planets in the Milky Way galaxy, um, which is just unbelievable, unfathomable. And to believe that we are the only ones out there, to believe that we are the only ones that have um, increased our evolution to this level and point, I think is arrogant and ignorant and just uh, um, incredibly stupid. Because you know what? Th this universe is made for life. And when we start looking at the other aspects of what we're just surrounded by here, Mars and the moon and, and ancient civilization ruins on Earth, um, we begin to see that our history has not necessarily been the truth of what history has been told, um, that there has been an over cover up through political structures to hide the true origins of humanity to, to hide, um, you know, what is on the moon, what is going on in Mars. And um, I'm, I'm just fascinated by talking about these topics because um, a lot of the times when you and I get together or me and other people get together, we don't always just, we don't only just look at these in an investigative perspective. We also solve problems. We also come about and we come to like conclusions like, Oh my God, like, yeah, like, that 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 is very very possible like that could be it and then we do more research and we find out that this is a rabbit hole that just keeps on going so i i'm just uh happy to be here this is this is absolutely awesome so we got a lot of good things in store for this show as well yeah man this has been fun i've been so pumped ever since you and i decided to just do this guys this was so organic if you have been following the origin of this whole series it came to fruition from a conversation josh we're having on another show and it just happened and this is how all of my work has been, it's been very spontaneous in many regards. It just happens. So I'm going with it. I think we're all sick and tired of talking about some of the subjects that are oversaturated right now, like COVID and Ukraine and all this other stuff, even though it's important, we're still going to cover it on our channels. I figured, well, let's get our minds out of the box and try to look at our reality and look at human origins and what's the history of our planet. What's the history of our solar system? What's the history of our species? There's so many theories out there. Science thinks they've cracked it and there's no mysteries left. Religion thinks they've cracked it and there's no mysteries left except in the pages of their books. And yet here we are with nothing but notes and maverick thinkers and authors and whistleblowers and people who were there uh, that have a totally different account than what most people have been told. And so that's what we want to do here is go through it, uh, give you our perspective. And I'm so, I'm so excited. Where to begin? Um, one thing I wanted to say right off the bat was as we were texting back and forth different ideas, you sent me the cover of the book, Dark Mission by mm -hmm. Richard Hoagland and Mike Barra. And I read that book when it came out. I don't remember. It was what mid 2000s or something. And I hadn't looked back, but I've been recently reading the Kindle version and going through it. And just in the introduction, I already was able to pull out some slides, uh, some different points that were made so that we can at least show this perspective of I, I want to do a sort of homage to Hoagland and Barra because they really, Hoagland was the first guy to really start bringing this out, this whole narrative that then eventually right. leaked into the Project Camelot era and then the other, and then Ancient Aliens, all these other shows that were built. Um, and everybody has sort of made their theory since then. And I'm not saying Hoagland got everything right or not. I'm just saying, well, let's make sure we know who started it. And so I've got those, we'll get to them in a little bit, but when, when did you come across that book and have you ever 
met or spoken to Hoagland or Barra in your career? So interestingly enough, um, I actually bought that book for my father uh, for Christmas, probably 15, 20 years ago. Um, at the time, I was really big into the Coast to Coast AM community. I was collaborating with Lloyd Pye and uh, uh, William, um, uh, William Henry and a few other guys on a few projects. And I was actually talking about a decade ago to a guy by the name of Richard Hoagland. And we were talking about torsion fields and hyperspace physics and a lot of these different things. Um, and a lot of great conversations, as well as Jordan Maxwell during that same time frame. Uh, me and him became good friends over a couple few months. Um, had a lot of deep conversations on the phone. But uh, Richard Hoagland, for those who don't know, was a former science advisor to Walter Conkright. Um, he also worked at JPL. <clears throat> and, and during the 1970s, um, missions to mars his photos uh, the photos that came out he's the one that first pointed out the face on mars if we remember this um and he started going out there and he developed a theory of which is i think it's called hyperdimensional physics in the sense that the geometry actually represents a, a part of the physical model of the universe um, but Richard Hoagland has been a skeptic upon his own work for a very long time and that's one of the reasons why um i, I hold his insight um, in high review is because I, I just listened to a 1998 um, or eh, 19, you know, it was about a 2000 it was after September 11, 2003 interview with George Norrie and John Lear. And so John Lear is the son of Bill Lear who developed Lear jets. Um, also DOD contractor, John Lear himself was a test pilot for the U S air force. Um, he ran cocaine for the, the central intelligence agencies. This guy was all over the place, but he came out with the whole, uh, George Knapp, Bob Lear story, but him and Richard were going back and forth. And, and John Lear had some really compelling photographs of objects on the moon. And this was him and Richard going back and forth. And Richard Hoagland believes, yes, there was an ancient civilization and that potentially that ancient civilization was on the moon and there's artifacts on the moon where John Lear was more like, no, there's like active bases up there. We went up there. We're taking them over. We're reverse engineering them. The same thing with Mars. And so Hoagland was like, ah, you know, I got to see the evidence. I, I want to see how, you know, I want to see where you're getting this information from, what sources you're getting this from. You know, maybe we should talk in private, but I, I like Richard Hoagland's skepticism. Because I think that really brings about a level of genuinism because we have to be a skeptic when we look at this, because if you take any of this information out into the public domain, it's going to be hyper criticized, especially by skeptics and being a skeptic yourself, you can start to pinpoint that, hey, look, these are their points of conjecture that they're going to bring towards you when you bring these bits of evidence up. Right. Um, there's one out there. It's the, the moon. And there's these parallel tracks that scan for miles. And the problem with them is they're parallel tracks. Now, you have something called fuddling that occurs on the moon. And this is where rocks slowly uh, move on the surface of the moon and create these trails. And this happens because of the moon's rotation and just gravitation and the tidal forces. And these rocks kind of get dragged like they do in the desert and the um, um, the the Mojave desert, you know, the, the, the floating rocks or what do they call them? The drifting oh, rocks, yeah. right? The same yeah. thing happens on the moon. It's called fuddling. But the problem is, is NASA came out and said, that's exactly what it was, but these lines are exactly parallel. Like you can, two rocks didn't make these. So what they came out is they looked back and they said, well, it was potentially, potentially the first actually um, wheeled Rover on Mars, which was Russian. So people don't know is that the first object that was on Mars or not on Mars on, on the moon that was a wheeled vehicle was Russian. And they claim that these tracks were made by the Russian um, spacecraft. Well, guess what? Russia has never claimed it, never said anything about it, as well as that has no it's nowhere near that landing site. So the question comes is what made those tracks on Mars that was taken pictures of filmed in the 1970s? Then you get these other things in the sense of the craters. You have certain domes. You have uh, the Chinese pictures that came back and it shows this vast like keyhole city type thing on the moon. Um, and you got to start to wonder. I mean, I went on NASA's website today David, and they had the thing on there where you can go to the moon. You can go through the whole solar system and went to the moon and you rotate it around to the dark side of the moon. Guess what? It's dark. You can't see it. They, they don't have it mapped out. And it's like, wait a minute. We've mapped it out. We know we have. We have satellites orbiting the freaking moon 
we have pictures of this. The dark side of the moon isn't completely dark 24, you know, 24 seven or, or, you know, 365 days a year during a new moon. The dark side of the moon is well lit up. So we have satellites that are taking imagery of this. Why aren't they showing that on NASA? Some questions to ask, man. Lots. Of, oh my God. Lots of questions. Well, Josh, I just want to let you know that, um, I'm already only like minutes in and I'm already being called a globe tard and a bunch <laughs> of other names. And I've got David Weiss stalking me here on Rockfin and a bunch of others. So it's just David Weiss. Ah. Yeah. What's up, Flat um, Earth Dave? You remember our conversation, buddy? We'd love to have you back on. We can talk about it. I'll bring on uh, Professor Dave. We can all talk. That would be epic. Um, and just so you know, I just created um, my own Telegram channel. Uh, it's called yeah. Flat Earth Refuted. I finally have put the notes that I've been taking since 2014, watching every second of the reemergence of those theories, watching the debates, collecting the data. And uh, so if anybody wants to go and check out what I've collected, it's over there on Telegram. You can go follow that channel. Um, and hey, that's just my opinion. And if you're not into that, there's plenty of other channels to go and check out. We're looking at this from a different perspective and that's our opinion. So there it is. Uh oh, did we freeze up a little bit? Is that David and myself? Are, are we back? Are we back? Oh, All right. We are we frozen? Oh, looks like it was my connection. Yeah, you it was yours. I was standing there like. Weird. Hey, it's those flat earthers, <laughs> man. They're hacking the system. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Well, as long as you can hear me. I don't know why my connection seems to be fluctuating here. I may, okay. Well, it's let me know if, earth, if flat it happens earth, Dave. again. It's flat earth, Dave. <laughs> it's either them or the, or the CIA, right? Right. Um, okay. Let me just pull this up. This is where we're going to start on something that just. To... Uh oh. Yeah, my connection's fluctuating big time, bro. I don't know what's going on. Hold on a minute. Let me come back. Go to your system task manager and look at your processes and see what your men memory and CPU utilization is. You might yeah. have to close out some things. Okay. Okay. Here, I'm going to jump. Uh, oh, I can't jump back in. Let me just try something. I don't know why this connection is only weird when I share. Let me try that again. Sorry, guys. Bear with us here. It's live. Live is the way to go. Okay. All right. Okay, affected. okay. Here we go. Let me do this uh, little slide here. So this is a quote from the book. You can get this on Kindle. Read it for yourself. They say something interesting here. This is from the introduction. With those first lunar orbiter images taken of the moon, everything, the reality of ruins, their extraordinary scale, their obvious presence on more than one world in the solar system, how their builders vanished suddenly was all too real. There had been a powerful, enormously encompassing, extraordinary solar system wide civilization that had simply disappeared only to be rediscovered by NASA's primitive initial probes, probes, a civilization that it would turn out later had been wiped out through a series of all-encompassing solar system-wide cataclysms. I just wanted to put that up there because that was essentially the idea that we were looking at when we were talking about this series. It was where this whole thing came was that, you know, we've got all of these ruins on our planet. You know, we could sit here endlessly listing them. You got your Kaliza temples, Pumapunku, all these, you know, the uh, different Cyclopean ruins, the pyramids, Adam's calendar, it's, it goes on and on. And they're, definitely not showing signs of primitive cultures with stone tools or these different tools that they tell you they built it. Uh, there's something interesting and mysterious about these structures all over the planet. There's even stuff they found on the bottom of the oceans that'll blow your mind. Um, and it's just incredible that not only do we see the megaliths, but in when you get into the world of the secret societies and all this Masonic stuff, they have encoded in their own symbolism a lot of the symbols of these monuments and, and this whole knowledge that they sort of flaunt and they tell you about. And um, so the question becomes, if we're not the only planet with intelligent life on it, um, in, the, in our solar system, in our galaxy, in our universe, then is it really so far-fetched to just speculate on the fact that if we have anomalous photographs of possible artificial structures on the moon and Mars, that th we're not looking at exactly what they're talking about, a civilization that wasn't just on Earth, but that we're talking about in our solar system. And we're, are some of these images images of those types of structures? Well, everybody's gonna have their points to bring about it, but I find it interesting that we're even at this point where we're still talking about it. And that that intrigues me, you know? So 
just, just off that, that first little intro, that's like on the second page of the introduction. I was like, okay, that kind of crystallizes what we're trying to investigate. Is that true? Was there anything to that idea, Josh, that you wanted to add before I move on about the fact that we've got these ruins here, we've got these photographs that are anomalous, that have geometry, that have, you know, some very interesting things to get into and we'll get into it. Are we the only ones? And it could it be that when we're looking at this mysterious lost civilization on Earth, that we're not talking only about a lost civilization on Earth? Yeah, you know, I think there's overwhelming evidence that we're not the first civilization that has become highly technologically advanced on this planet. Um, last night I had on Jared Murphy and we were talking about this and he spent his life dedicated to uncovering the mysteries of a lot of ancient cultures and civilizations to where he believes that there was a highly technologically advanced ancient civilization on this planet approximately 50,000 years ago. And, you know, I think that's what uh, Mike Barra and uh, Richard Hoagland are talking about as well. It's probably the same civilization. But the question is, is how do they disappear through systematic cataclysms almost overnight, especially when they have that level of technology? To me, that's the part that doesn't make sense. That's the part that I question. It's not whether there was, because I think that there's overwhelming evidence that there was. The question is, is, you know, there's not going to be some type of solar system wide event that's going to wipe out them on all the moons and all the planets that they are on throughout the solar system. There is not going to be some singular event on earth that's going to cause it to happen. And when we start looking at it in that perspective, there's only one kind of conclusion that I come up with, and that is war, which means that if there was some advanced human civilization that was spread throughout the solar system, they either annihilated themselves through warfare or something else had to come into the solar system to annihilate them. Or maybe it was, you know, a mutual annihilation. I don't know. Or but a I series think, of multiple events, maybe. Right, or a series of multiple events. But I think the more and more we investigate, we're going to start formulating a narrative that is kind of like when we pull back the veil of, of deception, we start pulling back this, uh, this mystery of what happened. We, we can start to see the facts begin to line up. And when the facts begin to line up, because we, the, the one unique thing about you and I, David, is not only are we into the UFOs and, and the aliens and, and ancient civilizations and artifacts on moon and Mars and current geopolitical situation and all this other stuff, but as we also have a background in the esoteric mysteries, occultism, symbology, mythology, and these other aspects, we understand them to a very, very high degree, which in my opinion, gives us this kind of um, upper edge in looking at a lot of this information, because if we we look at a lot of the people that brought this information forward um, into the world. None of them have those levels of background. None of them have this level of investigative background that really looks at information in, in a 40,000 foot view, eliminating all of their preconceived notions. Like when I read something, I'm not sitting there going, okay, well, you know, you know, G I love Jesus. So I'm going to read this, right? I, I leave all that behind. I leave all my preconceived notions behind. And I try to understand it from the mindset and the perspective of somebody who had wrote, written this 5,000, 10,000 years ago, and maybe what they were trying to perceive or trying to correlate to the world through mythicism. Right. And, and so when we look at things in that perspective, it brings about a whole different level of understanding. And I think that's what we're doing with this topic as well, is we're looking at it from this, this 40,000 foot view that gives us this unique perspective on it to really say, Hey, look, you know, this is kind of factual. We we've heard Buzz Aldrin talk about this, or we've heard this person talk about this or Edgar Mitchell mentioned this. So that goes up here in the fact portion. And when we start looking at that, I think that by the end of this series, however long this goes, we're going to be able to formulate a picture, a worldview picture of what happened, how it happened, who it was, and, and what really transpired. That's my hopes, at least. That's my goal out of all this. Well, I'm glad you brought that in. That's my goal, too. I mean, we're just here investigating it, and it's important to look at it from different perspectives. And, you know, even if there's perspectives you don't like in this series, I mean, the, 
it's not about likes. It's just, you know, do you want to look at the whole pie? You want to look at all the pieces of information and look at it from that way. And then you can go and collect the information yourself, read these books, look at the sources, take notes of the names we're mentioning and follow up. And that's the end. This is a process of discovery. Mm -hmm. um, and what I love too, is that you brought up is the symbolic mythological side of it. And, you know, what's interesting is that the idea of there even being because right now it's very popular where you got all these newbies coming into this movement that have all these theories about NASA and the history and masonry and who runs the world. And yet with people like Hoagland, he was the first guy to come out in, from what I saw uh, from a very high level of being involved with the whole NASA uh, em empire, let's just say, mm -hmm. and to actually say, yep, there's Freemasons, there's cultists there are satanists there's good people there like he had a very nuanced view and i'm going to get to some quotes from the book where he actually talks about it but a lot of people forget where that e that idea even came from the first guy to bring pictures to the world in his books about you know these aprons that these guys were wearing and these masonic symbols that came from hoagland and these guys yeah. and then other people extrapolated out there and then now it's funny to see those same voices attacking people like richard hoagland and i'm like you know, don't bite the hand that feeds you. At least listen to what the guy's got to say, because yeah. uh, he was the one that gave you the idea. You wouldn't have had it without him. So with that said, um, really quickly, I'm not going to read this whole thing because I just realized how long it is. But just to show you what he brings up is this Brookings report. You've heard of this mm -hmm. Brookings report from NASA where they basically looked at the if they ever found anything on any of these planets that they wouldn't tell humanity. This is basically mm -hmm. what this report is and the reason why they wouldn't tell humanity. So it kind of gives you an, another perspective as to the motivation behind the secrecy. Because everybody's, we all agree that NASA doesn't tell you the whole story. But there is, what I see is an extremist camp that pops up because, and I think that happens just because people come in, they don't understand the nuances, they don't understand the history, they don't understand all the moving pieces. So they just jump to the conclusions of, well, if they're, they're, they lie about everything, it's 100% a complete, total lie, all of it. But that's not actually how the dark occult works. And I just, we kind of highlighted this last show. I don't want to belabor it. But the reason I want to talk about it is that we have to start asking the question, how do we differentiate? It's nice to just go, there's this group of bad guys controlling the world and, and controlling information. And they're all sitting at the same table and they all work arm in arm and they're all perfectly harmonious together. And they started on this day and to this day here, they are the bad guys and they're lying to everybody. That's just not how it works. It's not as, as cut. That's like a cartoon PG version of the thing. When you start diving in, what I've learned from my mentors of studying this a long time is that it's very nuanced because you as a human being are nuanced. There's parts of you, there's light and shadow in all of us, right? And so there's many motivations and competing factions at the top levels of all of this. And that's what we need to understand. And not all of those competing factions are working against the best interests of humanity. Many are humanitarians. So just because you see Masons or you see these things, putting everybody into one basket and then labeling them with the crimes of other groups or other members of their groups, I don't know how we can call that uh, a sane investigation. I mean, if it's true, it's I, true. I, I concur. But, yeah. What do you think about that? So I've always called it the multiple heads of the Hydra and it's a war of the roses is that there's a lot of people that sit at the mm. table. They don't always agree. Uh, they actually never agree because if they did, the new world order would have been here 22 years ago. Um, and that they're a continuous battle for power. And I think that some of them are humanitarians. Some of them love America. Some of them love the world. Some of them love humanity and they want to see it progress into the future. Um, excuse me. Other ones, I think we care less and they just want power and control and people to go away. Um, but I think there's also a, a sinister aspect of this. I think that there probably is a, a hand above a lot of these people um, that, that controls them. And I don't know if that's uh, an infiltration aspect from ETs, ultra terrestrials or subterrestrials or whatever. I don't know. But I do have a feeling and my intuition is very good that there's some type of guiding hand to a lot of those global elitists. Um, and that that's been happening since the 1920s through Germany, Nazi Germany, the occult orders that rose up out of that, and the search for the relics of these ancient uh, civilizations that were on this planet and the technology that they had. 
Yeah, because they all went, and those are great points, they all went looking for this ancient knowledge from every camp, from whether you're talking, I don't care what group, whether it was Nazis, whether it was the Vatican, whether it was, you know, Columbus, whether it was these astronauts from NASA, whether whatever it was, there's been a collective effort to find out the knowledge that we're talking about, to try to find out the truth. I don't think a lot of these globalists had the whole picture the way we like to think of them in our cartoon version of how they operate. Um, like they're these all seeing, all knowing, you know, maybe the archons above them, but the guys we're talking about, the people working. One thing that pops up a lot is the symbolism that is put out through the media and through a lot of the imagery. And it's often looked at from the sort of Christian perspective of, well, anytime you see symbolism that isn't Christian, it must mean they're communicating some kind of evil demonic agenda through the symbolism. I mean, and many of them are, trust me, but that doesn't mean in all times and places, we could also be dealing with something where there's a stranglehold over these groups. There are many from within that are dying. But if you talk to people like Bob Dean, may he rest in peace. He was the gentleman at the end of that clip. Uh, you know, he would come out and tell you there were many people that he knew from within the military, just the military alone, that were dying to tell the world what they knew, what they saw, what they experienced. Yep. And but many of them had th there's leverage against them. So they can't. So what they do is they communicate even in these producers in Hollywood, they communicate symbolically. So they're not just taken out. They communicate in a way to try to warn people or throw little crumbs to humanity to say, I can't tell you the whole picture. Or it'll kill me and my whole family. Um, but I can give you the hints. And if you can put the pieces together, you'll get the picture. And so then it becomes a different thing of going, oh, is everybody just part of these big, dark, Masonic, Black Lodge cults? Or are many of them also communicating symbolically because they're trying to alert humanity, hey, you're on the right track. Here's the clue. Follow that clue. Follow these symbols. Because a lot of the symbols that a lot of these guys use, they found in the geometry of ancient structures that they've recovered. So they didn't just learn it in some satanic group. They learned it from studying the ancient cultures of the past that left these ruins behind. Yep. So just wanted to make that clear. Now, really quick, let me just show you about this Brookings report, okay? Because this, uh, this is where the journey begins, let's just say. And my slide is cut off, but don't worry, I'm not reading it all anyways. It says here, contrary to public and media perception that NASA is an open, strictly civilian scientific institution is the legal fact that the, that the space agency was quietly founded as a direct adjunct to the Department of Defense tasked with specifically assisting the national security of the United States in the midst of a deepening Cold War with its major geopolitical adversary, the Soviet Union. It says so right in the original NASA charter. And before I read that, I just want to point that out about the time we were in geopolitically when they were doing the Apollo missions was that we were in a race against the Soviet Union. We were in a Cold War against the Soviet Union. So that absolutely has to be factored in when we're talking about secrecy going down at NASA at the beginning level, okay? But let's just go into this. Section 305 of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration says that um, in this uh, charter, they say, the administration shall be considered a defense agency of the United States for the purpose of Chapter 17, Title 35 of the United States Code. In another section of the act, this seldom discussed defense responsibility, the ultimate undercutting of NASA's continuing public facade as being strictly civilian uh, scientific agency is blatantly spelled out. <laughs> uh, just so you know, Hoagland has the best long sentences that just keep going on and on. But anyway, he goes on. Section 205 says, NASA information which has been classified for reasons of national security shall be included in any report made under this section of the act. So clearly from this and the other security provisions incorporated into the act, what the Congress, the press, and the American taxpayers get to see of NASA's ultimate activities, including unretouched uh, images and data regarding what's really on the moon, Mars, or anywhere else across the solar system, is totally dependent on whether the President of the United States, and of course all the levels above him, um, are going to sign off on it, essentially. And I've, uh, it, So what we're just trying to illustrate here is that just for maybe a lot of the normies that are new to this kind of research, that have never heard about this stuff before, who look at NASA right now as being this publicly funded, uh, you know, openly, uh, there's, there's open scientific uh, dis debate and, or what we say, research going on there. It's all publicly funded by taxpayer money. Um, what we're trying to show is that, no, it's actually still subject to classification under the Department of Defense. Yep. And then there's the whole, that brings in the intelligence industrial complex and the military industrial complex, doesn't it? It does. It does. And 
you know, a lot of people don't believe that a lot of our government organizations, uh, the administration aspect of them, are actually private and they're owned by offshore foreign entities. And NASA is one of them. Um, you know, one you know who one of the founders of NASA was was a guy by the name of Dr. John Parsons. You ever heard of John Parsons? Yes, but it's been a while, so please refresh he, my memory. He uh, he was a rocket engineer, one of the founders of NASA. And he was an occultist. And so he actually oh, would conjure cool. spirits up with, uh, he was a thelmic, so he, uh, the Lima. He studied the Lima, which is the basically the religion of Aleister Crawley that has infiltrated Hollywood um, that I've talked about greatly. Not that they're evil, but it has the potential to be very, very evil. Um, but John Parsons died at 37 years of age very mysteriously. Um, but he was one of the founders of NASA, and it's kind of interesting that it has this occult origin in its its history. Werner von Braun is one of the people that first helped organize NASA and get NASA going. He came over through Project Paperclip to the United States of America from Nazi Germany. He was the one that held all the patents for the V2 rocket, which eventually became the Atlas rockets. Um, Werner von Braun um, was part of Hitler's inner circle. He was part of the Nazi occultists. Um, and you have to wonder what they were really uh, uh, studying and what they were believing and what they did believe. Uh, but Werner von Braun on his deathbed, uh, Carol, Carolyn Rosen, Dr. Rosen, if you guys have ever oh. heard this, this was his uh, young lab assistant. This is the woman that was at his side, validated factual history at his side on his deathbed the day he passed away. And she came out and said, Dr. Von Braun told me this is what they're going to do. And this was actually the birth of what something we know of as uh, Project Bluebeam, of where they were going to have a fake alien invasion, that everything was a lie, that they've had these craft for a very long time. They uncovered them in ancient civilization. Like all of this stuff was legit. And I think she's still around. I mean, we should be a good one to get. Is she? Oh, yeah. I can't remember if she's still. If she is, man, it'd be cool to talk to her. Another, you know, actually, as you're talking, Josh, I'm thinking too. Um, Joseph Farrell would be Ooh, yeah. awesome for this subject. He wrote a book on the Nazi Bell, and uh, he goes deep into the whole Nazi connection to NASA and the history. He's another great guy to talk to. NASA, Nazca, Nazca, Nazca. Uh, a lot of people say so. Wasn't NASA originally uh, originated at the study of the seas? Isn't that correct? I don't know. I, I just heard I thought about the. I think it actually originated out of NOAA, which was basically going into the depths of the ocean and studying the ocean. NASA basically spun off from them and became the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Now, it could be. Yeah. And I find it interesting because a lot of flat earthers say that space is just water or whatever. I mean, you have to uh, understand um, rhetorical hyperbole in ancient texts, what they write with both left and right brain thinking when they right. talk about stuff. So they make examples based on the knowledge they have at that time of the universe and the world they live on. And then they craft entire narratives and mythology. And then they anthropomorphize stars and create characters out of them. Mm -hmm. And then they make stories. And then we read the story. And if you take it literally, you're missing the point. And so, yeah, there's many points to dig out of that. But um, on this track, on this track, let me just get into, because we're already here. Let's just go to this one Let's real quick. It. Another bit from this. This gets into where the whole thing about the occult side of NASA comes in. So they say this, the enthusiastic architects of the continuing NASA Brookings cover-up, in part, are the same heroes we've been encouraged to worship as some of the leading pioneers of our technological era. Their names are synonymous with America's achievements in space, science, and rocket engineering. In many cases, they are also men with secret plans or secret pasts. Germans, Egyptians, Englishmen, and Americans, men at the very fringes of rational thought and conventional wisdom. These literal fringe elements then, so they're identifying them as fringe elements within the government and NASA, okay, are divided into three main groups inside the agency. We're talking about NASA. As best as we can tell at present, for the purposes of this volume, we shall call them the magicians, the masons, and the Nazis, and deal with each group separately. I found it very interesting, Josh, that they he started off by talking about how they were going to break up three groups 
that have their own ideology and their own uh, agenda, essentially, that were already involved in NASA. And within, the, within those groups, that was already fringe. Okay, so we're not talking about everybody in NASA. We're talking about these fringe groups, okay? And then they say each sect is led by prominent individuals and supported by lesser known players. Each has stamped their own agenda on our space program in undeliable but traceable ways. And each, remarkably, is dominated by a secret or occult doctrine that is far more closely aligned with ancient religion and mysticism than it is with the rational science and cool empiricism these men promote to the general public as NASA's overriding mantra. And I found that last statement powerful just to speak to those people out there that think that, oh, science is, or NASA is just some kind of science organization and it's just about science and how could you attack science? We're not doing that. Uh, just so you know, a lot of the top scientists that the people in the materialist scientific schools look up to are themselves occultists and believe in mystical traditions. And that's what they found. And that's why you see ancient religious mystical symbols all over your scientific organization. But the last caveat to that is that doesn't mean it's all evil, but we do know there is a dark evil side to a lot of those occult groups. And when we're talking about power players that would want to get into those key positions to infiltrate and don't forget what the goal is as it's now is to destroy America and to destroy Western civilization. And even the idea of having a people that were so uh, well off because of their system that were at a point in their evolution where they were ready to move away from just survival as they are in many of these other third world countries and actually go and explore space. They wanted to nip that in the butt and create the illusion of a public space agency and then create a secret space program. And uh, I've got some guests in mind down the road that we could get into duck about that. But what do you think awesome. about that, Josh? Well, you know, I think it was interesting that Hoagland pointed out magicians, masons, and Nazis, because if we look at that multi-headed hydra, the world order that is operating right now, those are the same three groups, the magicians, the masons, and the Nazis. Yeah, what is it? The wizards and warlocks or something? I can't remember what the whole Well, that would, that would be the, the whole, that's the the same. whole letter the good 17th guys. letter saying if okay, you say it okay. even on youtube like and just saying your alphabet you'll get banned so uh but <laughs> yeah the magicians it. the masons and the nazis um you know occult here, here's groups, a, basically occult groups that's right i think here's a good place to start is um i, I want to talk about the uniqueness of our moon i actually um i had a mm. book sitting right over here um it was called our created moon and uh it was written by two PhD physicists who were very, very Christian, nothing wrong with that. Uh, but they talk about the moon and its uniqueness. Um, and it took me, it's about a, a 200 page book. It took me about uh, 35 minutes to read the other day. Cause I speed read. And I skip a lot of words and pages, but one of the things that stuck out to me was this, there's hundreds of moons right now in the solar system. Okay. Our moon is unique in the sense that it is the only moon that is one third of the size of the actual planet that it orbits. Okay. That and secondarily is that it does not orbit the equatorial radius. It orbits the ecliptic, which is the area of how the, the earth actually rotates around the sun. So the, the orbital radius of the earth and the sun, it orbits that straight line of the ecliptic. Now, this is interesting because of one small little thing that happened in Earth's past. See, many, many scientists believe that Earth was hit by a gigantic meteor, meteor or comet a long, long time ago that basically made the Earth wobble and rotate at 23.5 degrees. So basically, the Earth is slanted at 23.5 degrees. Now, what's interesting about that 23.5 degrees is, is the only reason right now that we have four seasons on this planet and that life is sustainable. If earth bounced back was regular, it'd be very, very hot at the equator, very, very cold in the North and the South. Okay. It is only that the earth is slanted at 23.5 degrees that we actually have sustainable aspects of life on this planet. Now, normally a planet that gets hit like that and moves at 23.5 degrees over its course of time would eventually go back to zero. Correct. It would heal Correct. itself. Yeah. But the only reason our planet doesn't is because of the exact position of where the moon orbits the earth on the ecliptic. 
If it did it on the equator, like every other moon, it would have bounced back to zero. But since it's on the ecliptic, it keeps the Earth in that gravitational tug and that 23.5 degrees slanted so that life can be sustained on the Earth. Now, that ha happening through random chance is astronomical. It's impossible. <laughs> yeah. I, I, there's a, is that the different? That's a different book than Who Built the Moon? Or is that the same uh, book? No, this is called, um, I, I had it down here. It's called Our Created Moon. 1992. Okay. So I got to yep. read that one then. Cause I have, I have who built the moon and then I, which is the one I think David Icke was talking about that book for a long time. That's where I heard it from. It's really good. And then this one here, it's just sort of a synopsis of all the books together. It's the secret influence of the moon, Lewis proud. It just gets in again, pointing out the anomaly. There's guys, you can go. I had a few slides. We'll get to them later, but I just pointing out like a handful of the anomalies of the moon. Okay. But there's a whole boatload of anomalies with the moon just with a lot of different things that you're talking about. And um, even talking about the moon rocks, the age is different. And the, the fact that they did that test where they exploded a bomb on the thing and it rang like a bell for eight hours, mm -hmm. which showed that it was either cavernous or hollow or something, that all the uh, asteroid hits all seem to go to the same depth, which maybe indicates like a harder shell on underneath the surface of the moon. And then of course we only see one side of the moon at all times, which is really interesting. And uh, it's perfect. The eclipse is absolutely perfect. The solar, the lunar eclipse is perfect in, in line with the way the sun is coming into the earth. And it's, it's, it's just it's on and on. We could go about anomalies. But um, I think I, what was the movie I watched the other night? There's two. And Lindsay, shout out to Lindsay, who's in the chat. How you doing, sweetie? Uh, we were talking about that movie Moonfall. This is the one mm -hmm. I was telling you in the first episode. It's popular on Netflix. Interesting film just to watch for symbolic purposes and what they're trying to tell you. Um, and then I watched the, the other one, Iron Sky, <laughs> where they had the Nazi bases <laughs> on the moon. Just a fun, like, they got, like the T Rex dark. on the moon and shit. Yeah, right? just yeah. insanity. But like, you sit back and you go, Hollywood has been subtly telling us things since 2001 Space Odyssey and so many other ways. And Hoagland's reading of that was that based on the Brookings report, of the fact that they literally said, and I will put a link, guys, after just so you know, after every one of these shows, you can go follow me on Telegram, DW Truth Warrior. I put the notes and the slides of these shows right there for you so you can go follow up. Okay, I'll put the link. Um, but the Brookings, you'll get the action. Go read the Brookings report. And they're basically saying humanity is not mature enough to hear this truth. So if we tell them we've got, we found bases that were not built by us on the moon or Mars or any anomalous thing like that, that indicates intelligent life is close to the planet. They truly believe, and there's many that believe this to this day. There's even people out there writing books, trying to tell the humanity that thinks, yeah, I still don't believe humanity is going to be able to take the truth. Um, but they believe that uh, the, the Brookings guys that wrote this believe that if they told humanity the truth, that we would have civilizational collapse. That's right. their belief. Bob Dean talked about it. Um, you know, we can go on and on. And in a way you sit back and you watch what just went down with this pandemic and you start to go, maybe they have a bit of a point, but yeah. is it worth it? I mean, to know the truth to me is worth it. I think humanity needs to know so that we stop tearing each other to bits over all these different perspectives and religions and cults and who's right and who's that. And who, like, if we could just have an agreed upon knowledge of our history and where we came from and what kind of a universe we live in, that would bring humanity together. But the fact that we're so divided is, of course, an advantage to the people that know the truth about it. Yeah. And so um, that's interesting to me that they actually, that was the foundational belief of NASA and the government at that time, which is another explanation, guys, as to why the footage we are looking at with this whole thing about them faking the moon landings and the whole deal looks so odd is that um, when I did an interview with Mike Barra, and I've got a clip coming up in a bit, where he talks a little bit about it, but he would look at it and say, well, it's not that they didn't go. Uh, it's that they didn't show you what they found because they were worried that civilization would collapse. And then they realized as well, these dark magicians, that there was an advantage to being able to control this narrative and keep humanity in a regressed medieval state of mind. If they can keep us in a medieval state of mind where we're com our thinking is compressed, our consciousness is flattened and we can't think in terms of infinity or the whole concept of the universe we're in, that that would give them an advantage because they could keep us in a regressed devolving state. 
That was the dark side of it. But on a practical side of it, it was just a bunch of guys in the military that went, <laughs> they're going to tear the world apart when they find this out because we have competing religions that are already tearing the world apart. What do you think is going to happen if we go, oh, guys, you were all wrong. It was this. It's the end of civilization. That's their nightmare that they played in their heads uh, on that side. So what do you think about that, Josh? Do you think it's there was a justification for that mindset in the 60s, you know, when they wrote this report where they were kind of like, look at America in the 1950s and 60s. It was a totally different mindset. If they dropped that on America back then, could America have handled it? Um, I, I think they absolutely could have handled it. The question is, is how would they have handled it? And that becomes the problem. Um, I, I think that uh, various ideologies that have presented themselves throughout the last 50 years have been a threat to actual truth, not only because that it, it, it disproves, in much of a sense, a lot of the, the foundations of those ideologies, but also because when people feel abandoned and they feel alone and desolate, they tend to put that finger of blame towards those who have kept that information from them. And so I think that what we would have seen is probably some, some protests and some violence and some revolts and people standing up, as well as a lot of radicalism is that radicalism would have drawn out from those ideological principles of people who wouldn't accept the information. They just look at another perpetuated lie, and that would have caused, I think, a lot of major problems. So um, I don't disagree with the Brookings Institute and their perspective there in the sense that, hey, look, we can't tell people this. This is going to change their worldview almost overnight. And what it does is it begins a formal collapse of a lot of the structures of society, of culture, and of government. And it really does, when you look at it in the ideological perspective, that people have certain beliefs and those beliefs for them are set into a rather stone, uh, whether you want to call it uh, the word of God or within the, um, the tenets of their doctrine, whatever it might be. But when you start to question those things, people tend to get radicalized and pissed off. And I think that they weighed that very heavily because I guarantee you what they did is they brought in people that were working with them that had top secret clearances and they showed them this level of knowledge and they probably watched the breakdown of these people realizing that everything that they've thought and believed their whole life was a complete lie. And that is something that tears a human being apart. Now think about that on a mass scale. Yeah. If you think trying to get people to come out from under their beds with their two masks on their face is hard. Wait till you bring in something like this. But interesting. So they said, this is what's crazy. When you read this yeah. book, guys, go read the book. It's, they, they put so many different bits that I think a lot of people didn't get to hear growing up. They didn't get to hear this side. Right? That's why I like it. Um, is that they said that there was actually a strategy that was founded later to, because they started seeing so much of this stuff and the amount of information that it was probably the, there were many uh, big moments in time with the whole UFO off world subject in the fifties, there was a big craze then, and then it kind of died out. And then, it, and then it, it really boomed again in the, in the late eighties and nineties, it was a massive explosion of this kind of stuff. And, um, they said, well, the only way that we can actually tell people the truth that we now know is if we do a propaganda, uh, agenda here through media to slowly get people comfortable to this idea. So by the, before they're going to come out and disclose everything they know, they needed to get everybody to the point where they could even accept this as a reality. And that is another possible explanation as to why we saw a massive change in the movies ever since the movie ET or 2001 space odyssey, all of a sudden look at your, the cartoons your kids are watching on like literally the cartoon network are all about this kind of stuff. The movies that are coming out, the, the media that's coming out, it's everywhere. They're trying to tell you something. And then there are these different competing factions that are all trying to take the narrative and twist it towards the angle they want to present to the public. And so we're all just kind of sitting here going, watching the adults, you know, fighting over how they're going to do this. And this is what I think is causing a lot of confusion and division in our own movement is that there has been layers of truth given to us through different mediums since this time. And then there has also been layers of disinformation. And so that's what our mission here is, is to try to go, well, how do we sift through it all and find out what the real facts are? 
Um, now, I, I want to comment respond. on this one post. Go ahead. This one one comment. So, uh, Morena zero one two said, "You guys are overthinking this uh, one too much. Humanity will be in awe, except it's an apathy." I agree with that most of humanity will, but you got to think about the mindset of the times, 1950s, 1960s, as well as you got to think about the money and the power circulating around the various religious and ideological institutions during that time, specifically the Vatican, the crown and the amount of power that they had in influence around various organizations around the world. In the sense of how does their power structure begin to dwindle? How does the revenue of the Catholic Church be, do, begin to dwindle when people start realizing that there was a civilization on this planet that predates uh, the Old Testament, that predates all known and written history, that extraterrestrials are real and there's multiple planets that harbor life within the galaxy, Right. And that they visited here. They've been here multiple times and they've been in, in communication with human beings. You got to imagine what that would have done to people in the 1950s and the 60s, as well as how it would have affected those public institutions who are dependent mm -hmm. upon that methodology of control over those people. And so that's kind of the perspective where we're coming from is we have, that's what I'm saying. That 40,000 foot view is you can't look at it from like, look, I would be fast. Like, Oh my God. Yes. Like I knew it. Right. Like you. I, I want to know. know. Yeah. Totally. Right. But, but other people probably not so much. Think about the people who are afraid to take their mask off. Think about people who are, you know, afraid to go outside because of germs. Right. Think about people who are controlled and manipulated simply by various radicalized ideologies on this planet, of which those ideologies are trillion dollar organizations that control every political, social and cultural aspect on this planet. They would be doomed because of this information. That's one of the reasons why the Brookings Institute comes out and makes these determinations as a think tank and then brings that as a formation, formation of policy to these organizations. Yeah, what you just brought up there is crucial. I'm glad you brought that up. That's Think about it, guys. Who is the most threatened on this planet by this kind of information? Who would love nothing more than for humanity to stay in a primitive state of mind and a primitive view of the world? Where does the, where's the best interest there? Well, obviously, we're talking about, in my opinion, the religious institutions of the world. Institutions, mind you, okay? Because I personally don't believe the concept of extraterrestrials eliminates just as I read in the first chapter, if you haven't seen the first episode we did, go watch it. I read you a bunch of quotes from Giordano Bruno and some others about the idea that this is not in any, it's actually humanity that has limited the creator by thinking that it's, we're the only ones. That the creator is infinite and so is the universe made by the creator. And so it's actually, it fits better than you think it does. It's just that don't forget who taught you the scriptures and taught you how to interpret them. If you actually go to a Jordan Maxwell or a Michael Tessarian or many of these other people, a whole host that could actually take you and go, hey, guys, you haven't been taking your books literally enough. If you right. want to be literal, let's get literal. And then they're like, no, that's too literal. We don't want to go that. We'll just stay in the medium literal that we were taught by the priests. And that's where they keep you. So what I'm telling you here is the Vatican, which to me is the set, that's the, set, the head of the snake in this world. Um, and now I'm not talking even about the building. I'm talking about the creatures that are, are part of that whole cult is that they have a vested interest in making sure that humanity's mindset stays primitive so that they can stay in power. It's their yep. business model. And they've been running the business model on this planet for thousands of years, my friends. So if this comes along, this isn't the PSYOP. That's what I'm here to say. That's my opinion after looking at it. The PSYOP is the covering up of this idea that we live in an infinite uh, universe and all of that and that we're not, we're not the only ones and that um, they would want to keep you in a primitive state because then you're going to go and worship at their altars and pay their tithing and put them and their people at the top of the heap. And you're not going to realize that, hey, if we live in an infinite universe, maybe I have an infinite universe within myself and I don't need to have all these priests and politicians and whatever's ruling my life, right? And that's not an equation they want you to work out. They want you to need them, right? And so mm -hmm. in my opinion, that was one of the major things was they said, we're not going to let the humanity know about this kind of stuff. Because guess what? If you think it's bad that uh, America or the West finds out that NASA had been covering this up for, say, 60, 70 years, and they are worried about that, because trust me, that's a really bad thing to find out. Like, oh, my God, yeah. these guys lied to me for 70 years. We're going to go like, what do you think Americans would do to them? 
Well, what do you think the whole world would do to places like the Vatican? That's if they exactly find out, right. oh, they've known this shit for thousands of years, guys, and they've been hiding it from you. What then? So do you see what level we're talking about, about who, who benefits the most from you believing that crap, that you are just this, you're isolated, you're alone in this whole thing, and uh, you know, keeping you in that primitive state? Yep, spot on. And uh, I, I mean, I fully agree with that. And it, for thousands of years, they've known this. Understand that. For thousands of years, they have known this. They've covered it up. And uh, they dropped hints as well as people have come along and learned these secrets. And this is where I think a lot of the medieval esoteric and hermetic mysteries actually start to pinpoint is, hey, we've, uh, we, we know this, this hidden science that uh, we found deep within these religious sects. And uh, we're going to start getting them out there slowly through symbology, through art, through music, through, you know, teaching people through books, through, through encryption within books. It's, that's why I was so fascinated with medieval al al alchemical literature is because they were telling us that, hey, look, there's a grand conspiracy going on here to control your mind. But here's the secrets that you need to know that will lead you in the right path towards the truth. And almost all of them tell you. Look within, look within oh. the truth is within man. A hundred percent. And, and that's Josh, this is why you and I are the ones to do this series. Cause I think you, we think alike in this way that there is so much more to who we are and our history that has so much relevance. And if we find it all out, then we don't need these guys anymore. And so this, in my opinion, I, I know there's a lot of people that are actually terrified. There's actually an, there's a sort of allergic reaction that humans have to speculating about the fact that they live in a, in a, in a massive universe. Like it, that freaks most people out because it takes away the feeling that they're, they have control over their lives, which I disagree with that equation, mm -hmm. but that's a big thing. And if, if we actually realize that that knowledge is your inheritance that was stolen from you, that actually there's a framework that would liberate you from understanding that. Because if you understand the hermetic truth, the hermetic, or the, let's say the hermetic concept that as above, so below, as within, so without the whole thing, then what we're talking about here is you are a universe inside a universe that just keeps a fractalized system. And that shows a totally much bigger and grander picture of what we call a creator or nature, or however you want to look at it, than what we've been given by religion. So that was a threat to them. And, um, Real quick here, let me just show you some of the symbols they go through because Ooh, like this is really key with, with NASA, right? And I thought I was really impressed to see this in the book. Really quick, they say, using commercially available celestial mechanics and astronomical software programs like the popular Redshift series, which uses the official JPL Empiricis as its database, we have been able to establish a pattern of behavior on NASA's part that points to something truly as inexplicable as it is exotic, a bizarre internal obsession by the agency with three gods and goddesses reaching across the millennia directly from ancient Egypt, Isis, Osiris, and Horus. It is these same three Egyptian gods whose mythic story has been documented by many Egyptologists and authors, including Christopher Knight and Robert Lomas in the Hiram Key, that are also a key to understanding the history of the Masonic order. As we shall show, it is the same it is this same mythology that is also at the heart of the various systems of NASA magicians and Nazis as well. This ritual Egyptian symbolism secretly practiced by NASA throughout these past five decades publicly shows up only in its repeating blatant choices of simple mission patch designs. For instance, if one looks at the official patch of the Apollo program, armed with our preceding heads up regarding the bizarre NASA focus on all things Egyptian, it becomes elemental to the match to match the A for Apollo as an actual stand-in for Asar, the Egyptian designation for Osiris. This successful decoding of the hidden Egyptian meaning of the Apollo patch is redundantly confirmed because Asar or Osiris is none other than the familiar Greek constellation of Orion, which is, of course, the background stellar constellation on the patch itself. In case you think such ritual symbolism is some kind of temporary historical aberration, confined only to the Apollo program of the 1960s, think again. When NASA recently selected a patch design for its new CEV spacecraft, which will eventually replace the shuttle and ultimately take American astronauts back to the moon, 
Look at what NASA curiously picked again. So it's right there in your face. And Josh, I know you are very studious on these ancient gods and goddesses, but there's so much symbolism to NASA and a lot of these agencies that comes from that ancient world. And then, of course, Egyptian symbolism. My God, you're talking Vatican, Washington, D.C., City of London, the Egyptian symbolism's everywhere. It's on your money. Why is Egyptian symbolism on your money, America? What does Egypt have to do with America? Unless well, the Masonic connection is known. Well, firstly, Egypt was the name derived by the Romans when they went into the land of Chem. Um, so that's true. Yes. So the, the, the land of Kemet, which means land of the fertile soil, of which I've looked at in multiple different uh, accounts and saw that I don't believe it was meant the fertile soil in the ground. I believe that the fertile soil that they talked about was the skies, the night skies, the stars in the sky, which was God's fertile soil in the sense of where how God grows is through the universe. Now, the the um, uh, the Osiris mysteries, the Horus mysteries that I see in mysteries. This is where my journey in occultism and mysticism really began. And it's one of the mysteries that I probably understand better than a lot of people on this planet. Um, Isis, Osiris, Horus. So you have the formative trinity here. Um, you have brother, sister, twins, Osiris and Isis. Um, and uh, Osiris buries his sister. His brother Set, who is the god of the other uh, underground, this would be a, a cumulative of Hades, right? Um, it becomes very, very jealous of him. Him and his thirteen or twelve disciples goes and on Osiris's birthday, they they make a makeshift coffin for him and they make it the exact length and width of Osiris's body and they say, you know, who can fit into the coffin? Whoever whoever wins gets a prize. And Osiris lays in there and the twelve disciples all nail it shut and then Set cuts it into a uh, hundred different pieces and throws it into the Nile river. Isis feeling really bad for her brother goes and picks up all the pieces, except she can't find one piece, which is his penis. So she melts him one out of gold. This is where you get the birth of the obelisk, the phallic symbol. And that night Isis becomes impregnated through immaculate conception because her brother was really dead. Um, nine months later, she gives birth to the resurrected Osiris through Horus. Horus is the sun god born on December 25th, born of immaculate conception. We know the whole story. Horus then rules and various other um, pharaohs and gods represent the Horian entity. This is also known as Ra. Ra and Horus are one in the same in the sense of the english language we have a draw in the sense of the context of this so if you watch the sunrise by the way horus is the literal sun and the transit of the sun through the sky isis is the moon osiris is the tapestry of the stars in the sky now if you watch the sun rise it rises on the horizon okay we track the, the degrees that the sun moves through the sky in a day through something called hours, hours, horizon. This is Horus. all derived from the word Horus. Okay, so I just kind of gave you guys the understanding is, is the 70, sorry, 72 disciples of Set. And the 72 disciples of Set are the various 72 constellations in the sky on the elliptic. Okay, and Set is representative of Saturn that is always pulling the sun down during springtime, right before the transition from dark to light. Now, Osiris at this time was the old sun being rebirthed, but it's really the tapestry of the skies carrying the sun through, right? Because that's how it actually happens is the, the skies carry the sun through. Um, but when she basically what you're talk, talking about in the Nile is a thousand pieces of Osiris on the Nile scattered. This is the rising of the sun and how it refracts and reflects on the water and it's fractured on the water. This is kind of the re relation of the story. Now, I just see to, sorry, just to pause you real quick, Josh, you said a thousand pieces on the Nile. That's the refraction of the light. This is that statement, a thousand points of light. That you, you actually heard George Bush Sr. give, by the way, when he announced the New World Order back in the 90s. Right. Now, here's the, here's the other thing. There's no, something known as the Icean Mysteries. The Icean Mysteries, okay? Um, the uh, Isis wore a veil, and there's two depictions of this veil that Isis wore. One of them is a full-bodied veil, and this really comes from the Rosicrucian orders in the sense that Isis veiled her whole body. Another comes from medieval hermetic 
um, derivation, which represents that Isis wore a veil upon her eyes. And it's really interesting because it doesn't say eyes, it says eye singular. Isis wore a veil upon her eye. Now, Isis, by the way, in mythology can be uh, Ayana in, um, in Sumerian lore, Athena in Greek, Minerva in uh, Roman, right? So we have this whole translation of this goddess Ishtar in Babylonian. Okay, but she wears a veil and it's said that she contains the secrets and mysteries of the universe behind the veil. She's the goddess of wisdom and fertility. And only one man hath come before her and lifted the veil. This is a guy by the name of Hermes Trismegistus or the god Toth that was later deitized. And he lifted the veil, learned the secrets, taught four disciples, sent them out to the four corners of the earth and started the world after the last flood. So this is post-Diluvian time. Now, what they're really talking about here, and I want everybody to understand this context, is that we're talking about anthropomorphication of various deities and of the sky. Now, when the moon is in the sky and the sun is reflecting off it from the other side of the planet, the unborn sun on the other side of the planet that you can't see, Horus, is refracting and reflecting off of the moon, producing a light in the sky at nighttime, can you sit there in ancient times and truly study the stars? It's really difficult to get a full view perspective of the stars. Now, the veil that we're talking about here is the moon. This is where we also get the word mono, meaning one, or monarchy, moon archy because the one thing that separate us between now uh, between us and the heavens is the moon and so the divine right the rule came from the female lineage of the moon goddess which was isis now isis represents that behind her is the tapestry of the universe this is osiris okay now ancient and she, and she, ju she just when you understood you were saying something there because if, if isis is the moon goddess and she has a veil and she only shows you one eye just on a practical level. This, the moon only shows you one side. There's That's a it. hidden side to the earth from the earth perspective. So there's Great the point. veil over the dark side of the moon and behind that dark side of the moon is what opens up the door to the rest of the solar system. And that's Osiris. And so Osiris is representative to them as the grand mystery of creation of the universe. It's the king of the universe. The king of the universe is the tapestry of the sky that, that evolves beyond the deceptive light, the, the veiling light in the sky that stops us from understanding the truer mysteries of what's out there. This would have been I, Osiris. And so this plays a complete role in ancient mysticism. Now, this story, I believe, was adopted into maybe an understanding of 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 these deities and their anthropomorphication aspects i think really what this is is that there is some very very ancient knowledge that tells many various stories of history because i know a lot of people out there they can pull this isis goddess they can pull osiris in they can say well they're evil and this is why they're evil and well how about this so there's a word out there in christian dome in in judaism in the abrahamic religions it means sin s-i-n right this was the original sin, right? The original sin is basically blasphemy in front of God. Did you know that there is a Sumerian God by the name of Sin? Yeah. And he was known as the moon God and he was represented by the bull's horns. Wow. It's and the almost... horns, that tells you everything because what did they depict Moses as having on his head? What was it? Da Vinci? Horns. Or Mike Elliott? Yeah, he had horns. Why? Because Judaism was birthed out of the moon cults of ancient Egypt in it's that right. in now in the occult world that's what they believe in Isis you will always see being wearing the crescent moon horns the horns of the crescent moon with the sun over top of it okay and this is representative okay not of a ball or a demon or Satan but of the moon. Now the moon is the deceptive light in the sky that tricks your mind from seeing the secrets and the mysteries from beyond. It's the same thing as the owl, which is represented at nighttime. That's hidden in the dark that hides the knowledge behind it. It's the same story 
with various cultural attributions told over and over and over and over, over again of the hidden mysteries, not only of humanity, but of the universe. Because if you study the sky and you study the stars, mathematics will appear to you and the brilliance of the creator's design of the universe will be shown. Bro, that was an epic summation of all those myths. Guys, that was like a book, just so you know, in the last little two minutes there. That was well done. And also what you just said with the whole goddess thing and the connection with Isis Osiris, the fact that this was the phallic symbol of the missing gold, the case of the missing golden penis. Like that's, yeah, that's basically right. the myth apparently, but uh, it's actually that whole obelisk symbolism. This is where we bring in Michael Vissarion's work. If you get into the female Illuminati, the whole goddess cults, uh, the dark goddess cults, um, that that symbol is not male. It's not nope. a masculine female. symbol. It's actually a female symbol. And that's where people go, what? I thought it was because it's a big giant phallic cock in the fucking city. It must be a male thing. No, it's the eunuch. What did the eunuchs do? They chop their, <laughs> they chop their manhood off to show what? Allegiance to the goddess cult. A whole chapter we could be done, but I want to just bring in this really quick, Josh, and yeah. just fill it in what you want to get into some more so maybe people that are kind of like, oh, okay, all that cool cultism and everything. The reason we did an occult history lesson there for you is because of what Hoagland is telling you in that book, which is you can just, you can see it now that you've seen it and you've heard it. You'll never unsee it. This is what those people believe. So all those guys that are like, oh, science just got rid of mysticism a long time ago. And now we just do things through calculations. Really? The top scientists in the world are occultists that believe in this shit. Okay. They put it all over everything. So it's good enough for them. It's good enough for you to look at. So here we go. This is about, this is Asmanov. Just to get into some technical things about the moon. So Isaac Asmanov, he was a, you know, get into his history. He was a giant in astronomy. He says, what in the blazes is our moon doing way out there? It's too far out to be a true satellite of Earth. It's too big to have been captured by the Earth. The chances of such a capture having been affected in the moon then having taken up a nearly circular orbit about the earth are too small to make such an event eventuality credible. But then if the moon is neither a true satellite of earth nor a captured one, what is it? <laughs> I just I thought that. this is one of the world's top astronomers. Okay. That is asking this question. And I think that's interesting. And then there's another one. This is a uh, NASA scientist, Dr. Gordon McDonald, 1962. I believe he was also a Mason. He said, if the astronomical data are reduced, it is found that the data require that the interior of the moon is more like a hollow than a homogeneous sphere. So he's already kind of giving you a little hint in just one statement. Hey guys, there's something anomalous about the moon. Maybe it's uh, not a big solid rock like we thought. And then really quickly, again, I won't read the whole thing. This is just a little bit on the Zulu people. And there are other ancient tribes that had this belief. Let me just go through it quick. The Zulu people believe the moon to be hollow. According to Zulu legend, the moon was brought here hundreds of generations ago by two brothers, Wanawe and Mpanku. They are known as the water brothers because they had scaly skin like a fish. This story is similar, of course, to Mesopotamia and Sumerian accounts about the two brothers Enlil and Enki. Zulu legend tells of Wawani and Mpanku stealing the moon in the form of an egg from the great fire dragon and emptying out the yolk until it was hollow. They then rolled the moon across the sky to the earth and caused cataclysmic events on the planet, which signaled the end of the golden age. Zulu legend says that the earth was very different before the moon arrived. This is where things get interesting. There were no seasons and the planet was permanently surrounded by a canopy of water vapor. People did not feel the fierce glare of the sun. The earth was a beautiful place, a gentle place, lush and green with a gentle drizzle and a mist. The water canopy fell to the earth as a deluge of rain. There's all the floods for you. When the moon was put into place in the earth's orbit, correlating with the biblical reign of 40 days and 40 nights. And there are many other indigenous cultures that speak of a time before the moon. And of course, many ancient texts speak of a time of great deluge and massive cataclysms. Enter your Velikovskis, etc. cetera. Wow. So you've, have you heard about this stuff, uh, um, Josh, about the time before the moon in ancient myths and legends? I have, but I haven't heard the, the Zulu one. So that is fascinating. That one, I think, is from Credo Mutwa and another uh, guy that were some of the last surviving Zulu shaman. I don't know if he's still alive or not. Credo um, Mutwa, no, he, he passed away. 
He passed away. That's right. So this, you can actually go watch an interview David Icke did with him back in the nineties where he kind of started that. And it's just interesting, a time before the moon. And when you get into some of these books, you'll read other ancient accounts that talk about this. And again, the ideas of the two twins, the two brothers, that the, the betrayer, how many times do we see this in mythology, right? Where one is the good, you know, goody two shoes, supposed to be the king, inherit the throne, but then he's got the evil rival brother. They even show this in the Ten Commandments with Moses, who's Akhenaten, and Ramses, right? The whole mm-hmm. dueling of the two brothers. Um, you know, there's your Enlil and Enki. There's your, it, it, you know, your Jesus and Satan, your Horus and Set, the whole thing. It's all there in all these myths. And are we talking, guys, about big stuff stuff going on in some other dimension? Or was this ancient man looking up at the gods, which were, in many cases, anthropomorphized planets and stars? And I think that if you bring in the whole ancient ET thing, they even had that notion of how to make those connections from the fact that there may have been actual visitation and some of these advanced beings may have walked among us at some time in ancient history. Now, this is interesting as well, because um, I talked about on last episode, uh, humanity potentially being from Mars because we didn't evolve here. We can tell this because of our skin and so forth. But the the Zulu talk about the water vapor that protected the races on this planet from the sun's rays, which I found quite interesting. Now, Alex Collier, he's uh, he's an alien or he's he's supposed I think he's an Andromedan contactee. Yeah, that's what he. That's what he's been saying for right. years. Yeah. So the Adramans came from the Lyran constellation, and he's a contactee. And what's interesting about him is he's been around since the 1990s, um, and a lot of the things that he said are pretty accurate th- that have happened. And he, you know, he gets this information from this one Andromedan. He's been on their ships. Um, I, I urge people to go investigate him in themselves if they don't believe me. But he talks about how um, how the moon got here. And it was brought, it was the 21st planet in another solar system, um, millions upon millions of light years away. And it was dragged here by the Andromedans and they attached it to a comet and got it into our, our solar system and brought it here and put it in its place for earth to basically, um, have the four seasons of sustained life. And I think it was called Wustaska was the name of the planet Mm. that they brought here. But it's interesting because it's kind of very similar to that story that you just told of, you know, all of a sudden the moon comes in and boom, the earth changes, major cataclysm. Seasons change. Yeah. Seasons change. All these things happen. Um, And it would be this one prevailing cataclysm on earth that would make a lot of sense is that moon coming in. And maybe the moon is very, very relatively new to the earth. I, I, I don't doubt it. And I think well, it's an and that's why I'm like, if we have okay, so if you bring in the Michael Cremo theory, which mm-hmm. actually he'd be a great guy to bring in for a little stint with this, because uh, he's a great guy who's talked about the evidence of human um, history being millions yep. of years on the planet. So my show um, this one. Oh yeah, okay, cool. Go <laughs> watch that show. Let me know, Josh. We'll tell everybody when he's on because that would be a great chat for you and him to have. Um, but you know, when you factor it all in, it's just it's just again, it's things that make you go. Hmm, it it kind of makes sense of some of these things. And again, guys. Forget about what you believe right now. The elites believe it. The, the, the Black Lodges believe it. The princes and dukes of Europe believe it at the top. This is what this is the kind of stuff they're into. Whether they believe it all or not is one thing, but they, they, they do rituals around these types of uh, events. And there is a connection with the moon. There's a connection with the, the lunar cycle and the timing of certain events that happen, like these Olympic Games, the inauguration of a new president, you know, Trudeau changes his socks. You know, these are all planned by the lunar cycles and the astrological cycles. So again, I always tell you, if you're going to be studying, and even if you're coming from a more uh, a stricter religious perspective on this, don't run away from us, guys. We're here. We're all friends here. We're trying to find the truth. Just look at it as that's what the enemy believes. You don't have to take it all on board. This is just what they think. And they're going to make decisions in, uh, on that worldview. Now, Mike Barra told me something. I didn't have this clip with him, but he told me something in an interview. And this is why I want to get him on as well. And Mike, if you ever hear this, please, man, come on. Uh, He talked about how there was an idea that Mars was actually a moon of another much larger planet. And that's what happened is that there was something. Did he say this last week? I said this last week. You said this last week. I said, what if, what if Tiamat was that planet and Mars was simply just one of its moons? That's right. 
Oh, there you go. So Mike Barra agrees in that sense. Well, let's have him on to pick his brain about it. Yeah. But that's an interesting idea that we're dealing with a dead planet now, right? On the surface, who knows what's going on. But um, if it was actually a moon of a larger planet that was destroyed, which people think now that's the asteroid belt or who, who freaking knows, okay? Nobody mm -hmm. was there. But here we have this mysterious planet and this mysterious things on it. It, it. it all just starts to connect if you think about it, right? And so before we continue, let me just play, because uh, Josh, I actually Good, yeah. got this clip because I want your take on it. So I'm going to play it. It's like three minutes. This is Mike Barra talking about kind of the whole thing. And then I want you to take it away right after. So sit tight, guys. Here we go. Here's Mike Barra. The bigger issue is that you're right. There is this, and it goes all the way back to the Brookings Report that I wrote about in Dark Mission and in um, Ancient Aliens on the Moon, where, you know, you have this political... This very careful political um, aspect to this question and the release of information must be incremental because if it's not, people will go crazy. That's essentially what the report concluded that NASA commissioned at the beginning of uh, the space program in 58 mm -hmm. before we even put a rocket up. You know, um, it, it's, it's just that the, the switch has been flipped. It's time to start putting some of this stuff out there. But I, I do have this caution for the community in general and the people that follow it, which is the, the UFO question, the alien question is, you know, when we talk about disclosure, we think we're just going to get aliens, right? They're just going to tell us about aliens. Like that's the biggest secret, the biggest, darkest thing that's out there. Right. And that's not true. There's Agreed. a lot bigger, darker, uglier, horrific things that are out there that are connected to this, that are part of disclosure. So it's literally a be careful what you wish for question and issue because you're you're not just going to get aliens. You're going to get all the other stuff that goes with it. And I think we can um, we can see from Twitter and from people that are on the cutting edge of putting information out. It, there's a lot of bigger, darker, uglier secrets out there. And so if we um, if we were to find out everything at once, it would be shattering to us, to many people, because there's a lot of people that don't want to know about this stuff. They don't want to admit. They are going to be in for a big fucking surprise <laughs> if, if those people, the hippies are going to take it on the chin and not everybody's going to be able to handle it. A lot of people are going to just kind of go off the wall and, and go crazy over this because it is going to be shocking and shattering when they find out because the good guys are not who they think they are. The bad guys are not who they think they are. And disclosure is not what they think it is. So, Agreed. It's so in fact, I've actually heard from people that are supposedly connected that what's out there is so big that they're not going to tell us all at once. And that's why we're getting this incremental thing because it's little by little by little because it's, it's that big a deal. The way I always put it is the best evidence that we have that aliens exist is the fact that we exist. If it, it, it it's impossible with all of the Earth-like worlds that must be out there in this galaxy alone, not to mention all the hundreds of billions of other galaxies that exist. It's a literal impossibility, mathematical, guilt-edged impossibility that we are the only species in the history of the universe that has achieved this level of consciousness and technological mastery as a minimum. So to me, once I figured that out, I'm like, okay, people can call me whatever they want for thinking that there are aliens, but they're absolute utter fools for thinking there aren't because mm. you want proof that aliens exist? Look in the mirror, you exist. So to me, it's a very short, simple answer. That's it. Wow. I Isn't love that. that. Yeah. Go, what do you think? There's one point in there he says, the good guys aren't who you think they are. The bad guys aren't who you think they are. And disclosure is not what you think it is. And Bombshell. Oh, yeah. I think that, in, by the way, for people who don't, Mike Barra was a co-author of Dark Mission with Richard, Richard C. Hoagland. Um, he's been very, very connected in the ancient alien community very, very well connected with whistleblowers, with people that are in, in the industry. Um, he's been that, doing this that, for decades. He's yeah. been doing this for decades. This guy is, 
he knows what he's talking about. And when he says something like that, I hope you heed his words. He said that it's so big. Like when he was talking about his industry insider that told him that it's so big that you wouldn't believe it. It's paradigm shattering that basically what they're hiding from you isn't the fact that it's just aliens. Okay. There's so much more. And you have to understand that when you open up Pandora's box, you're going to get the bad with the good. And there's probably things in there that are going to fuck people up. Hippies will take it on the chin. (laughs) I love how he's, you know what, what he's saying there. And uh, I I love hippies, man. I live near there. God love them. But uh, in, in many ways, but in this case, what happens is, you know, people project their own virtue and their own, worldview of what they want onto things. Uh, we've seen it. This is all the study I've done in cults and, you know, we, we project, right? And so there's there's sort of an adult conversation that's to start happening, especially because I, guys, I've been in the UFO community since 1999, okay? I've been doing this stuff forever. I've heard every theory. I've, I've probably got the slideshows of every guy you know on my computer from when we did all these tours and events. Um, and I've looked at it all. And this is a this is something that was unique because there are basically two camp. It, it, the whole UFO community got into two camps. One camp is that all these this is the Stephen Greer camp. They're all love and light. Mm-hmm. They're all our space brothers. So the space brothers thing is is and even Sitchin would have taken that in a way, which is to say, oh, the Anunnaki coming. They're, they're the gods. They're the ones that they came because to be benevolent and give humanity a chance. We were a floundering primitive species and they came and it wasn't a lightning that hit the bottle. It was genetic manipulation, but it was for good purposes. It's all very positive. And and this is where actually the new age movement kind of went off the rails. And this is where you started getting all these channelers and everybody and their mother is contacting the Pleiadian people through telepathy. And it just got freaking nuts which is a sign of psychological masking. That's what I see. The vast majority of the new age and UFO community is psychological masking. In fact, I see the entire conspiracy movement in many ways like that, but I'm not one of those people that like the materialists will do, which is go, Oh, well then it's all hogwash. No, it's hiding what he's saying behind it. This is humanity's reaction. Our innocence is reflecting back like a mirror. Think mirror, right? Our innocence is reflecting back to us and we're coming out with, oh, well, these guys are just here to help. Well, okay, roll up and get people like Dr. Carla, um, what was her name? She was a PhD professor, brilliant in the 90s, Dr. Carla. I talk about her a lot. Jordan Maxwell referenced her. Uh, She wrote a book called uh, something about angels without wings or whatever, basically saying this whole thing is all bad. So it became the other side, which was like, they're all evil. They're all just controlling. They're all demons. They're all this. Well, and that's the perspective of like Bill Cooper and all those guys as well, yeah. is that they're all demons. And, right, right. Yeah, and that I, came I from go. a Christian mind, which is what you get, which is still kind of trying to come out of the dark ages in thinking, yeah. right? And no insult. And there, I know brilliant. Actually, there are many Christians that could explain this better than I can. I'm not here to insult yeah. anybody. I'm just saying, let's talk in generals, right? there's a reason we're not getting to understanding all of this is because we keep hitting that ceiling and the ceiling is trauma. So if there was past trauma on top of trauma throughout our lives, on top of all this pushing and pulling, being lied to, manipulated, the Hollywood, the glitz and glamour, you put it all together. It doesn't really surprise me that the UFO subject has become a circus and a cesspool of disinformation. But so here we go. Two extremes. One extreme camp is all these other people, and just forget about all the alien stuff you've seen in movies, people from other places, okay? There's other other people in other countries from where you live right now. Like you live, I live in Canada, You live. there's people in America that live there. Okay, so then there's a possibility that there's people living on other planets, right? Okay, that's so. So when you take that into consideration, you go, well, on this planet, there are people who create art and literature and poems and philosophy and science, and they're good people and they're benefiting humanity with their life work. And then there's psychopaths, there's cult leaders, there's serial killers, there's genocidal maniacs, right? And tyrants. So we are a mix in this dimension. This is a duality that we live in. So for us to go, oh, it's only good guys or it's only bad guys is the dumbest shit I've ever heard. I agree. It's both. And that's actually where Alex Collier had come in 
when I watched him back in the early 2000s, just hurt. He was very adamant about that point. And that's what attracted me because everybody else that was saying, I'm talking to the aliens. We're all like, oh, they're just here to pet our heads like we're a bunch of cats and give us some treats and take care of us. And he was like, just wait to find out about what they're doing in the underground bases, guys. It's a mix. OK, there's good and bad, just like there's good and bad humans. So that's what I loved about Mike Barr's statement was he was trying to say, guys, and it goes even bigger than that. Just the largeness of it, the scale of it. Look at how people are running away from the idea of that big picture like you can't believe. That's what I think a lot of these flat earth movements are is a regression back into the primal archaic state of thought that our ancestors at certain times in history were trapped in only after the cataclysms and the traumas of the past. Before in the Atlantean age, they already knew this shit. It got happened after the cataclysm. We went into archaic dogmatic thinking that was born out of trauma. And there was a priest class on this planet that saw a traumatized being and said, oh, we got a way of taking advantage of these creatures. So that's my reading of it, is that there's a force trying to regress human consciousness and there's a force trying to evolve human consciousness. But here's the pickle. You can't just go, oh, you want to know the truth? Okay, I'll tell you the truth. Most people, probably even you and me, Josh, would find many elements of what that big picture truth is to be incredibly traumatic. And so we have to take baby steps. And that's why drip, drip, flood. That's right. what's going on. And also the competing agendas aspect as well. So I got to ask you, what was the dark side that uh, Mike Barrow was talking about? He didn't elaborate, but I think he was taught, he mentioned, um, I think he started at that point because I interviewed him, I think 2018. So before the whole pandemic thing, it kicked off. Um, I think he was talking about what had started to come out about the trafficking, mm. the the cults, the sacrificing, the you know the dark stuff we're learning about the children, um, adrenochrome. The, the yeah, the I think he was hinting at that, and I was think I think how do I get into this? If if you really think big picture, guys, okay. Remember, none of these topics we're talking about are in some kind of isolated chamber. It's all going to intersect because here we are living in this reality where all these points intersect. That if we're dealing with off-world beings, what if part of these groups that come here come here for the same reason we go to get animals from different parts of the world to make into pets, to go into DARPA labs, to create chimeric creatures, to make them into food, to breed them into pets and all these things? What if there are types of beings out there that came here and saw primitive life and saw the exact same thing? And so they actually saw that there was a sort of food source that was there, both on a maybe a physical level and maybe even an energetic level of some kind. And that there is a sort of... <sighs> well, so Dr. I don't Michael even want to Sala, get into it. It's too big. Yeah, okay. Well, Dr. So Dr. Michael Sala, Dr. Michael Sala um, he talked about this and he said that um, there are certain races out there that um, like... Human beings, they utilize them as slaves. Um, they rather have have them when they're children. They utilize them as slaves, as well as there's some beings out there that get intoxicated through the, the glandular system in human beings. And that there's elite families on this planet who have made trillions of dollars simply by the exchange of human beings. And they, they take children and human beings, they take them down to Antarctica, and that is the point of exchange. And those people get on a ship and they never come back. And um, I, it was interesting because I was with my uh, my co-host, Jason, my brother, on the show. And Jason said, well, well, what's the currency? And Michael Sala said, DNA. DNA and, uh, is the currency of the universe. And doesn't it make so much more sense? And that was another thing Alex Collier had said. That was the first guy I heard that from was that, oh, the because Sitchin said it was about gold, right? right? That was his theory. And maybe there was an element. Maybe, I mean, if you're looking at a planet and you're going to do all this work and effort to come out here and do something, you're going to look at it as, well, it's got to check multiple boxes, right? Yeah. Maybe some planets can offer you some resources, but it's maybe sparse. And there's no real, but you have a planet that's in its beginning evolutionary stage. And you come in and you go, oh, well, we've kind of thinned out a lot of our DNA through the constant over interbreeding, which is a weird problem in the elite royal blue blood lines, by the way. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and you get to a point where you're 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 a small planet now. You have a small population, and you have to survive. Your species is threatened, and so what do you need? You don't you can't keep rebreeding because you need a new element. 
So they go, in, we, we have the technology to get off, but we're dying. We're a dying species. So let's go look in our vicinity to see if we can find the genetic codes and the structures that would help us replace what we've lost through our, whatever, our own history. And that is one sort of practical explanation of why we would look at it. I mean, most people that go and eat any, everything you eat is living. I don't care if you're a vegetarian, a vegan, a me, I don't care. Life eats life. Everything's alive until you eat it and kill it. Yep. Okay. Um, so <laughs> do you have a, con a crisis of conscience before dinner every day? <laughs> right? The subjugation of plants and animals to your survival? No, you think of that as a natural process. And I'm not here to tell you that it is. This is nature. So I don't believe that it's amoral. It's like a lion. Are you going to say a lion is a, is a blood drinking, psychopathic maniac that just wants to tear a bunch of deers apart? No, it's just part of survival. My little cat who will sit with my six-year-old, seven-year-old daughter purring and, and being a cutie and soft and likes to be pet and sleeps with her in bed every night, just tore a baby rabbit in front of my daughter's eyes and disemboweled the thing because it's like, hey, I'm bringing you food. Yeah. So it doesn't have, humans are the ones that have this propensity for an actual like- This moral attribution. To get joy out of it, right? So um, that's where you start to go, okay, well, it kind of then makes sense that at least- some beings that would, uh, some people would come and go, hey, we got resources, guys. Look at that. And look, oh my God, have you ever tried the adrenal gland? Like, I don't know. I, it, it's, I know it's out of the box. I, I don't, um, I would like to get some other guests to come on and kind of break more of this down because I don't want to scare off all the people that are here just to learn about the planets and stuff. But it is interesting, guys, when you put it all, yeah. when you, it, Josh and I have been looking at this material for so long. If some of the stuff we're talking about just sounds batshit crazy, even though you've been watching all this shit in the movies your entire life. Um, just remember that there's degrees of this information that you have to digest. Yep. And when you really think about it, is it really so crazy? Come on. Well, is it crazier than Jupiter what we learn in religion? Come on. Have you seen Jupiter Ascending? I didn't see it. Is that another which well, You need to go things? watch that. You need to okay. go watch it. You just I, need to I've go been watch putting it. it off. Okay, I you will watch just it. Just go watch it. Oh my, okay. after this, you need to go watch. I will have it watched before the next chapter of this series. Okay. The House of Abraxas. The okay. House of Abraxas. Just understand that. How about this? Is I think that uh, movies, I don't think the Wachowski sisters or brothers, I don't think they write shit. Okay. I think that yeah. they maybe redo the screenplays a little bit. But uh, basically, what they it's do all is handed they, to them. Yep. Yeah. They hunt for the certain scripts that have certain aspects and relevances of truth in them. And I think that that's why these movies are made. And Jupiter Ascending, if you get past the whole storyline of love um, and you look at some very interesting parts, one of the interesting parts about Jupiter Ascending, and I'm not going to ruin the movie for you, is reincarnation. Now, they talk about reincarnation in a very scientifically identified process, is that your DNA... Is something there's something known as resurgent DNA, as in um, your DNA is completely unique unto yourself, and it comes about through billions upon billions of combinations of amino acids, right? But resurgence, what they call resurgence or um, re uh, or reincarnation, is basically when someone has passed away, and all of a sudden that same genetic genes, the same DNA, occurs again. It resurges again on some planet. And basically, think about it is that you have a spirit or a soul inside of you. That spirit and soul is energy, so therefore it's oscillating or vibrating. And it means it's vibrating at a certain frequency. Well, your DNA are the antennas, right, that pick up that soul frequency and hold it in the body. And so that means that when that DNA comes back again, you know, 50 years, 100 years down the road, it's going to pick up your soul energy to incarnate into that body. It's called the resurgence. It's a phenomenal perspective on reincarnation, and I think it is 100% legitimate. That's interesting because there's, I mean, reincarnation, by the way, is one of the oldest forms of belief on this planet, okay? So uh, however people want to conceptualize it, and in the end, I don't know because I haven't died yet. Well, allegedly, I don't know. But um, the, this idea is very much known about in the world yeah. of this ancient mystery school knowledge and the occult. It's talked about everywhere. Uh, this and is, Christianity this is, up until 1610. It was removed from the exactly. Bible in 1610. 
the Apocrypha. Oh, yeah. And so much more. And what, what's hidden under those? How many miles under the Vatican? What do you think is hidden there? The, the remains of the conquering of the planet. And just so people know, um, I get stuff all the time about, you know, people coming in, they're learning about all these different families that control the banking industry, and they're trying to identify who's doing all this shit to us. And they'll start looking at people like the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers. Hey, great places to go because you're looking at mafia families, etc. However, let's not forget about the agencies that are still in power in this world, that still are existence in this world today, that conquered the world multiple times over before the Rothschilds were even a speck of dust on the planet. And then when you when you factor in the quotes from people like Giuseppe Manzini, who took the mantle of the uh, Bavarian Illuminati groups and whatnot, where he's talking about how they're in the secret society brotherhood in the knowledge base, there is knowledge of something that's above even them that they still perceive as a mystery. So if you think you're going to go and knock on the, no the, the doors down in the Vatican City and go, hey, can you tell us all the answers to these questions? They'll probably have some answers for you if they were having a good day, but even they're in the dark about a lot of this shit. And so I just threw this question because I was doing a tour um, a few years, or I was 2015, 2014, I did the tour. It was called the Disclosure Tour in Canada. Um, and we basically flew to all the major cities of Canada and we brought in, you know, we brought in um, all the greats. We had uh, Paul Hellier there, former defense minister of Canada. Oh, we had Richard Dolan coming in. We had Stephen Bassett from um, the Paradigm Research Group. We had, uh, bef right before he passed away, um, we had, why am I drawing a blank? He's one of the great ufologists of all time, nuclear physicist, Stanton Friedman. We had Stanton, Stanton Friedman. Friedman there. My wife and I had lunch with him. He was a lovely man uh, from New Brunswick, I believe. And we had a bunch of these guys come in. And we just had these conferences. And every single one of them, I brought this idea because they did their presentations. And these guys are, you know, they're the guys, right? And I just asked them because they were all talking about disclosure. That was the whole theme of the thing. And they're all sitting there waiting for the government to walk up and disclose this information. The only guy that wasn't was Dolan. Dolan is actually one of the more intelligent guys to ask about this subject. And we're going to, I want to bring him on. Oh, I'm good awesome. friends with him. Um, he also does a lot on the secret space program and whatnot. But when one thing, the reason I'm bringing up this long story is that I brought up this idea that the reason they're not disclosing could be not that they don't want to, but that they are not in control of that discussion. If you take in the fact, the whole Eisenhower story and some of this information, I mean, again, we're, we're speculating wildly here, okay? But in my intuition of looking at it all and kind of just scratching my head and going, why are they only teasing us with disclosure, but not fully? Well, one explanation is the Brookings report and that worldview that they're like, we are going to tell you guys, we're just going to drip it out slowly until you're ready for it. But there's also the fact that there could be an element where they are ordered not to buy whatever is visiting this planet because whatever is visiting this planet would have the view that everything living on this planet is their property. And so if you think that, you know, Trump's going to get in there and just come up and tell everybody the whole truth about it, even if he wanted to, he might be held down by a directive that's coming from something that, <laughs> again, think of Mike Barra saying about how big this shit is, right? Yep. Uh, that that might be the reason why you can sign all the petitions you want. You can do all the conferences you want. You can try to get everybody around it, but they're not going to do it until they're allowed to do it. And so that means something else it, that isn't us is running that whole thing. So that was just my sort of way out there theory. I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, I, I'd love to comment on this. And so uh, one of my favorite television shows, and I talk about this all the time because I've seen the whole series about 10 times. So there's 10 seasons. Um, it's too boring to watch now because you know exactly everything's going to happen. Is Stargate SG-1. Now, the movie came out in 1998, the movie Stargate. Now, when they came out with the series in 2003, I think it was, they made some changes to it. Now, it came out, the series came out on the Sci-Fi Channel. Now, if you remember from the movie, um, these aliens were taking human beings and enslaving them on other planets. They utilized stargates to travel between planet to planet. And there was this one planet they took them to called Abydos. And Abydos was an Egyptian-type 
a planet. They they held people down. They didn't uh, allow them to learn knowledge or the read or the write or any of these things. All of this was forbidden. Few people knew how to do it. They were known as the mystics. They taught people. But there was a gray alien who was known as the uh, the Goa Wuld on this planet that ran that planet. His name was Ra. And so he was the god Ra that ruled over this planet in his UFO. And Kirk Russell and the team, they go and kill him and they end it. Well, the series takes over right after that, right? And uh, they had to secure financing from uh, the get the show on the Sci-Fi Channel. And one of the things they did, since they were going to be utilizing um, NORAD's headquarters, they were going to be basically utilizing all the pictures of NORAD's headquarters in the mountain, in uh, Cheyenne Mountain, right, in Colorado Springs. They're going to be utilizing the U.S. Air Force. And so they went to the United States Air Force. And they said, hey, we got this show that we're going to do um, this is our idea. And the air force came back and said, sure, we're going to fund it for you. Not only, so we're going to fund it for you, but you have to make these small little changes. And I'll tell you the small little yeah. changes, but on the three, the hundredth episode, the secretary of the air force actually was in the show. Oh yeah. Like I, I look up, the, look up the history of the show. It's fucking mind blowing. But so here's one of the changes they made. Number one is they moved away from the great aliens. They got rid of the gray aliens and they made them these snakes called Goa'uld, which are these serpents. And basically you had a Jaffa, which would like incubate it in their belly for like 120 years. And then that snake, and they all had genetic memory. They had genetic lineage. So each snake would have the memory of its parents and all the parents before that and the parents and grandparents before that. And what happens is the snake would enter anywhere in a human being or a host and it would wrap around the back of your spinal cord. It would suppress the consciousness and it would take over that human being. Now, one of the other places it also entered was in the eye. So the snake could go directly in through the eye, enter in, wrap around the, the brainstem and suppress the consciousness and take over that human being. And then they would be various gods. There, there was just various gods. There was Cronus. There was a Apophis, right? Okay. So this is where it gets interesting because what you were just talking about so the Goa Wuld had claimed domain over Earth. Now, there's this other alien species that they meet later on, and they're the gray aliens, okay? And this is the Asgard. And so they're led by their commander, Thor, who is a little gray alien, and they got amazing technology. They're from a galaxy far away, right? But the Asgard comes in there and they re renegotiate the treaty with the Guawuld, making Earth off limits because of their technological progression of where they've advanced. And now that they have space travel, they're no longer they're no longer can be ruled in, by a superior race. They are off limits. And so what you just said right there, I'm like, oh, my God, that's that's Stargate. That's exactly what they were talking about, is that Earth itself is in a protected treaty to where. Here's, here's also the thing is Earth was in a protected state and status as protected by the Asgard. But the Asgard also said is that you can't tell the people on your planet about this. There's just too many threats out there. What happens mm -hmm. when you have 8 billion, billion billion people on your planet and now all of a sudden you have inner exchange with all these different alien species and the Goa world come in and they just take over your planet because they just start infecting everybody. And they take over the whole planet and you don't even with know snakes. it. Mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, but I'm telling you, there's more truth yeah. in that series, in that show right there. than than we can probably get from a lot of different Hollywood movies. I have to go watch the series again, man. You're blowing my mind with that. And for people that go, dude, that's movies and television. That's not empirical data. Look, we're, we're, we're opening the door of great mysteries and trying to pierce through layers of classified information and just trying to see, because here's a weird humanity's lucky in one sense that yeah. for whatever reason, these controlling, whoever they are, these families that know, and even they are compartmentalized in what they know. Okay. But they're, let's just say there's what we know officially on the surface dwellers of with the surface dwellers of the world, which is us. And then there's what's known by the highest levels in the world, right? Whoever's running the show, they know a certain amount. And then there's what's to be known, okay? So we are not even close 
in, in the mainstream to opening the door of what is known on the planet, let alone what is to be known. So one way that they distill this knowledge is in, in one sense, they want to hide it from us, but they also want to tell us. Yeah. And then some factions are more strict about that. They're like, you will never tell anybody. And then there's a few guys that are like, I'm telling them. <laughs> well, <laughs> like I'm Stanley Kubrick, goes I'm going go to go make what, a film about, you know? It goes back to what Mike Barr was saying. It is exactly what they were talking about right here in Stargate SG-1 is exactly what Mike Barr was saying is that once Pandora's box is open, you cannot put it back in. And That's that, right. it, think about this, is if we open it up and say, okay, guys, look, there's a galactic federation, there's extraterrestrials out there, it's all real, yep, there was an ancient civilization, we, we used to be more advanced than we are, this is the technology we have, the whole doors are open, now we start inter-exchange with extraterrestrial civilizations here on this planet. What's, what's the potential that out of our 8 billion people, someone fucks up? Someone messes up. Someone brings a bad disease back. Now there's now there's more massive weapons to utilize, more various types of chemical and biological weapons that can be brought to this planet and utilized by radical people on this planet who are like, they're all demons, right? Like, there's so many circumstances that we have to look at on this. Now, one of the other aspects of Stargate SG-1 is the, the Asgard had genetically altered themselves so many times, made so many copies, because basically they're the same soul over and over, but just living in different genetic bodies, that their, uh, their civilization was dying. And basically they had uh, genetically modified them out of the point of ascension, so they could no longer ascend. By the way, in the series, the whole point of life is to reach a point of ascension where you move on to the next dimensional level of spirituality, of spiritual living, of understanding of life, where you become pure energy. And the, the Asgard had basically uh, genetically modified themselves out of that point. Now, there was another guy, his name was Loki, that was doing tests on humans here on Earth to try to save his race. The and he was doing right. genetic tests to try to see if he could make a clone to save his race. Now, all of this correlates. <laughs> no way. Yeah, oh like my God. Well, watch the Thor movie, the Disney Thor movie. I know fuck Disney, right? But just they telling you everything, okay? And they've already pillaged all of your great traditions and they made films out of it. So it's uh, you can still get some things out of these stories. They're telling you the whole time. Um, if you watch the movie Thor, the first Thor in the Marvel series, Mm -hmm. The first five minute entry where you've got Anthony Hopkins narrating the whole story. If you have Anthony Hopkins or Morgan Freeman as the voice with the sort of narration, I'm always like, take some fucking notes. Okay. Yeah. They use those guys for particular uh, little scripts that they put in. And James, Earl Jones. Whole, James Earl Jones. There's certain guys that they use as like, they're the father figure in the mind of the public in the media. And think about it. When you watch, Oh, Anthony Hopkins, he's the, that's the man, you know, like that's how people think. So when you have him playing, um, he's the father of Thor, right? Yep. And so he's telling you the history of the interaction between their Asgardian people and earth and that they sent, what's the story guys? He set, he casts Thor out of his kingdom for being arrogant. And he says, go learn the lessons on earth. And if you can gain the power back to wield the hammer, you can come back into the kingdom. Where else have we heard that shit before? You think Disney created that? That is every myth and legend, solar hero story ever written. It's a okay? hero's journey. It's the same story in everywhere. So what I'm saying, this is what Jordan Maxwell had said years ago to me. He was like, the reason the story you're going to see in the Bible as interpreted through a one dimensional lens, but if you zoom back with the keys of decipherment, you can see the whole picture. The reason you see that story and they call it the greatest story ever told is because it's the only story that's ever been told. Yeah. It's the same story. Do you know, there was tw at least 20 preceding traditions that told the exact same story before Christianity was even a blip. So they got it from somewhere. Right. And that means Okay, if these guys that look at history in this one-dimensional way look at these scriptures, they go, oh, it's just a bunch of campfire stories. It doesn't matter. That's retarded thinking. They're telling you a truth wrapped in myth, and they're repackaging it. And guess what? Not only are your spiritual traditions recycling the same ancient story that I think was the lost story that came from pre-Diluvian civilization, they're telling it in all of the cartoons all of the comic book hero stories, all of the movies, all these television shows. Think about what a television show like Stargate SG-1 is if you really zoom back. I mean, Ancient Man didn't have television and movies as a way of depicting heroes and telling stories. 
So what they did was they wrote it down. And most of them were illiterate, so you needed priests to translate what was written down. The rest was oral, oral traditions, or pictor pictorialized traditions. The first languages were pictograms and, and, and hieroglyphs. So when you put it all together, the, the sum total of human knowledge is trying to convey a message of, that has been put into human consciousness by these stories that is actually the same story. We've been fighting and killing each other over the same story. And that's insane. And so in one sense, disclosure of that truth, the positive side would be to unite the world around a singular understanding of truth, uh, of that truth. Okay, I understand there's always a subjective side of things. But there's, uh, imagine we could all just sit back and agree on where we all came from. Isn't it amazing that it's 2022 and we still aren't settled on that discussion? You have all these camps and everybody's chiming in and now there's even new theories being invented. And you sit back and you go, we don't even have it nailed where we freaking came from. And here we are thinking we've solved all the mysteries of the universe. We're infants. And maybe that's why these people have the belief humanity is a bunch of children. We have to yeah. raise them and groom them and farm them and put them in the position where one day they'll be worthy to know the truth. But I believe that humanity is not just some slave race. I believe we're imbued with the consciousness of of the creative force of the entire universe of what we call God. So all the knowledge that can be known is already somewhere within you. It's just that on a physical 3D level, our genetics have been firewalled. Our minds have been firewalled and we've been exposed to so much propaganda that it's, we're all lost at sea. And that environment is the perfect environment for a small rogue group of people to be able to continually manage this farm. And one of the secrets they don't want you to know is not just your origins, it's about who they are. And that's where it comes into this big picture. So guys, I know we've dropped a lot of stuff on the table here. Josh, I have one final clip. It's yeah. a, a, another clip that I put into chapter two of Cult of the Medics. And a, a lot of people were like, wow, we just went there. Like we went from talking about uh, pharma and Templars and all of a sudden we're on the moon. Um, Sergeant Carl Wolf. Uh, he came out in the Disclosure Project hearings of 2001. I watched it live. And all the testimonies were fascinating. I was so mm -hmm. curious about everybody that came up. Um, actually, that was where I first heard about the Werner von Braud story from um, the lady Carol you mentioned, Rosen. Carol Rosen. And then I watched Carl Wolf come up. And his testimony was like two minutes and 30 seconds. And so I encapsulated in this clip. So I'm just going to play it. It's uh, a continuation of what you got in the intro clip. But let me know what you think after. Here we go. Another example of compartmentalization was the Manhattan Project. Personnel at Oak Ridge constructed and operated centrifuges to isolate uranium-235, but most did not know exactly what they were doing. Those that knew did not know why they were doing it. Parts of the weapon were separately designed by teams who did not know how the other parts interacted. And of course, there's an entire story about the Manhattan Project we could get into, but we'll save that for another series. So now you know about compartmentalization and how even classified information in the military intelligence communities are held from public view. They're even held from presidential view and we have to understand the nature of secrecy in government is far greater than the average person out there probably can even imagine. My name is Carl Wolf and I was a precision electronics photographic repairman with a top secret crypto clearance in the United States Air Force. I was stationed at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. In 1965, um, in mid-1965, I was loaned to the Lunar Orbiter Project at NASA on Langley Field. Uh, Dr. Colley was in charge of that project. They had problems with a piece of uh, electronic equipment that was bottlenecking their production of photographs. I went to the facility and when I walked into the facility there were scientists from all over the world. I was stunned actually to see people at a NASA project uh, from all over the world. It didn't make any sense to me initially. I was taken into the laboratory where the equipment was malfunctioning. I couldn't repair it in the dark. I asked to have it removed. A uh, Airman second class was in the dark room at that time. I was also an airman second class. I was interested in how the whole process functioned, how the data got from the lunar orbiter to the laboratory. I asked the young man if he described the process to me. He did. 
About 30 minutes into the process, he said to me, um, in a very distressed way, um, by the way, we've discovered a base on the backside of the moon. And then he proceeded to put photographs down in front of me, and clearly in these photographs were structures, uh, mushroom-shaped buildings, spherical buildings, and towers. And at, at that point, I was very concerned because I knew we were working on compartmentalized security. He had breached security, and I was actually frightened at that moment. And I did not question him any further. And a few moments later, someone did come into the room. Um, I worked there for three more days, and I remember going home and naively thinking, I can't wait to hear about this on the evening news. And here it is, more than 30 years later, and I hope we hear about it tonight. And I will testify under oath before Congress that what I'm saying is the truth. So Josh, you were in the you were in the Air Force, man. No, Navy. Sorry, you're in the Navy. Navy. But you kind of know how these things work. That blew my freaking skull off when I was watching that for the first time. And I've never lost a memory of that man. Sadly, he had a tragic accident. Mm -hmm. um, but damn, that's interesting. Um, and it's probably very, very truthful. I think that a lot of the things that came out of the disclosure, some of the things that I think that came out of the disclosure project were, I think, people fabricating or exasperating maybe their their uh, their experiences. Um I, I had an experience um, and it was kind of interesting is, well, I've had actually quite a few of them, but in the Navy, we had uh, two experiences that I remember very, very vividly. Um, actually there's three of, there's a crypto cryptid one, that, but, but that doesn't really, uh, it actually fits into this, but we were operating about 300 miles off the Galapagos islands in the South Pacific off the coast of Peru. And uh, this is, if you look at the South America, you know, that big part of the ocean where there's nothing there in the Pacific ocean, right. yeah. there's this like a whole side of the globe is just ocean. We were over there and we were looking for basically drug smugglers coming from Peru and they go to certain waypoints outside of the Galapagos islands because hundred miles outside of the Galapagos islands, it's all protected water. So uh, U S Navy and other types of military vessels aren't allowed in those waters because they're protected. So that's where the drug smugglers, right? If you can't go there, then they can go there. They don't care, right? No one's patrolling it. They'll go there and that's where they'll drop off the drugs for somebody else to pick up and take into the shore in central America. We were operating out there and I was working, um, uh, I was working on a fire control radar. So I worked uh, um, radar watch. So midnight shift, uh, you know, 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. And I'm on a fire control Mark 92 radar system, which we could hit about a four inch. Um, we could hit a four inch log from about a mile away with a three inch, a three inch gun. So pretty accurate radar, right? Um, and we could track that log as well. So, you know, our radars are pretty accurate. We had a SPIS 55, a SPIS 49. So we have an air search radar that covers about 250 nautical miles. We have a surface search radar that covers about 50, 50 to 60 nautical miles. And then we have a fire control radar that covers about 20 to 25 nautical miles. Um, I'm, I'm a smoker at the time and it's like two in the morning and I'm like, looking at all the radars. I switch flip, 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 nothing. There's nothing out there for 250 miles. I go down the port side midship and the things that we look for are, you know, uh, any, any type of lights or anything like that. We run dark at night. So the only thing that we have is a little mast light on the top of the ship's mast. It's red. Everything other than that, all running lights are off on the ship. So we go completely dark in case we sneak up on somebody. And so I'm out there and it's pitch dark, calm seas, really, really calm ocean. It's like one of those oceans where you look at and you can see the reflection of the stars in the ocean is absolutely mm, beautiful. Oh my God. That must oh, be yeah. Oh, oh it's, it's amazing. Dude, it's some of the most amazing times in my life looking at the skies on a ship oh, in the no. middle of the ocean where there's nothing. Um, but it's smoking my cigarette and I see on the horizon. So your horizon at this point, um, nighttime, probably about 16 nautical miles on the ocean, right? And I see a red light fly up in the sky, just kind of whoop. And it had like a little trail off of it, right? And it kind of sits there. And I'm like, oh my God, that's a that's a flare. It's an emergency flare. Someone's in trouble. So I go and I call, you know, I call the bridge and I'm like, hey, we got a, a, a red flare, portside midships, about 16 nautical miles. And they go out there and they have the big, 
big eyes. They call them the big eyes. Big these big binoculars that sit on the the bridge of the ship. And they're looking. Yeah, we're seeing it. We're watching it. And he goes, uh, Petty Officer Rita. I, I, you know, I got a I got something to say to you. I'm like, what's that? He goes, um, I don't think it's a flare. I'm like, well, why is that? He goes, well, usually flares drop after they launch into the sky. Right. This is just floating there. And I go, I'll be upstairs in a minute. So I flick my cigarette and I rub cigarette because obviously they want me to get a radar track, right? So we go up there. We're all trying to find this thing on radar. Nobody can find anything. There's nothing on radar. So we start turning our course directly towards it. And uh, we start moving towards it. And we're not like getting close to this thing. It's not, it's as if it's moving away from us as fast as we're moving towards it. We can go, you know, 20, 30 knots, right? 30, 40 knots, can't really, dis- well, yeah, about 33 knots is what our max speed was. Uh, but we have a SH-60 Bravo on board, which is a helicopter, and they can go about 150 knots, 120, 150 knots in speed. And so they, they go wake up the captain. The captain comes in the combat system, sits in the, the, the CSO's chair, and he's got his underwear on, and he puts a big old stogie in his mouth. It was back in the early 2000s, so you got, like, the old school mentality, right? And he's, like, puffing his cigar. He goes, where are we at? What's going on with this thing? He goes, sir, we, we don't know. And he's looking at it through the big eyes. He knows it's out there. And he goes, uh, get the helo. Let's get the helo out there. So the helo starts doing spins, and the helo launches to go out there. Oh, let me remove, um, hide user on this channel. Boom. Okay. Uh, so the helo starts moving towards it about 120 knots. All of a sudden, we get this thing ping on radar. And it starts moving away from the helo at 120 knots. So it matches the helo speed. It stops. The helo starts coming towards it. It drops down. And the helo's got FLIR on it, which is an infrared radar. And so we can get a visual. We're streaming this live in combat systems on a big LECD screen. And we're watching this object. And the object splashes into the ocean. It was bigger than a helicopter, by the way. Splashes into the ocean. And we're watching this heat signature just dissipate into the ocean. And takes off. And the pilots are like, uh, what was that? And everybody's like, uh, kind of like everybody's looking at each other like, uh, and the captain goes, all right, guys, this is what we're going to do. Um, delete that FLIR video, erase everything from the logs. I don't want to deal with the paperwork. See you in the morning. Really? That's what he said. That's what he said. Just delete it. Just delete it. Get rid of it. Like, this is a peak experience for me, man. I can't just delete it. So that whole next two weeks were very, very um, weird. Like I I remember every deployment I've ever been on. I can probably recount every port I've been at. The next two weeks were a haze, a blur. Just kind of like Mm. we we saw some cryptid. We saw a cryptid bird, like a seven foot 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 bird that looked very human like that actually landed on our ship that we had on video. Um, But like, I just remember it was very, very quiet. Nobody talked about anything. It was like everybody was like just zombified and it was just very boring. It's like, that's all I remember from this whole time. It's very boring. Um, this other time that we uh, crossed over the Panama Canal, we just got out of the Canada, Panama Canal and we were just in, getting into the Caribbean. And like you see the mixtures of the waters, you get out there. And immediately when we get out there, we pick up this contact and the contacts moving at about 30 knots, which to us is a speedboat that's running drugs from one island to another island. And that's exactly what we're looking for. And so we start chasing this. We get a P3 Orion in the air. The P3 is doing um, basically overhead surveillance and basically giving us the radar telemetry data back of what this contact is doing back to us. And uh, the P3 comes out and it's like, um, guys, this is going to sound weird, but uh, we lost the contact. We're like, well, what do you mean? Well, we don't know. They're traveling at 30 knots, and all of a sudden they increased their altitude to 5,000 feet and took off about 2,500 knots. And we're like, wait, what'd you just say? And all of a sudden, beep, on the radar, about 30 miles away, it pops up. 30 miles away from where it was before. And uh, we we relayed that to the P3. They changed their direction. They go, oh, and yep, sorry to got pause it. you, but you, yeah. you knew that it was the same thing that you had seen because you're getting it from the radar mapping, right? No, we had no idea what this was. We we thought the, else. Okay. we thought the radars were just screwing up because usually when you see uh, on, on various different radars, unless you get like a, um, uh, a spy 
one of the the newer spy radars those are the ones that are going to give you accurate elevation on these older air surf search air and surface search radars your elevation really isn't that accurate so but when the p3 sitting there telling us like hey it rose in elevation this is kind of odd but they don't see anything they're not seeing it anywhere and so it pops up like 30 40 miles away and we see it first we relate that to the p3 they change their course and position and they're like guys we're right over top of it there's nothing here all of a sudden, it bloop, goes across the screen on the radar, probably about 2,000, 3,000 miles per hour, and ends up like 60 miles away. And the P3 is like, you got, this is like three in the morning, by the way. This goes on from about two in the morning to about five in the morning. And the P3 and us, they had a refuel, stopped out, refueled, came back in. Uh, we chased this object back and forth. It was going up 50, 60 thousand feet now elevation it was going 2000 knots and then it was going to 30 knots above the ocean level until we're just it's like impossible shit right like just oh, for yeah. somebody like this is not nothing you yeah. knew of that can do that no absolutely not and this is just sensor data that we have right and but it's right. correlated sensor data with a p3 that's in the air and two surface ships that are tracking this object and we're all getting the same thing. Like if we sitting here fucking with us, if we sitting here, next thing you know, it pops up like 4,000 feet and takes off 60 miles away in a, a second and a half. And the P3 would turn around and start going back. To, yeah. So we've had multiple different experiences. Um, pretty crazy. I, mean, I, I had one off the coast of San Diego um, where I'm sitting there and I'm always, whenever I'm outside, I'm always, my eyes are up, always up. And I'm smoking a cigarette, and this we're all, we're just about 150 miles off the coast of San Diego, so you still had cell phone reception in the back in the 3G days. So a lot of people were out there, you know, with their cell phones, and there's about 30 of us out there. We we're just coming back from about a, a two week uh, training uh, mission out in, in the sea, and we were waiting to pull into the next day. And I remember this because it was my last cruise on the ship. It was December 28, 2007. I know this because that was my birthday. And, um, so we're sitting there and I'm like looking up and all of a sudden I see, uh, you ever seen the satellites in the sky? Oh yeah. I those watch them every night. Well, I, those aren't I satellites. Watch shit at, no, 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 no. The majority of those are not satellites. Um, and so I'm watch, I see the satellite go across the sky and I'm watching it. All of a sudden you see one come in like this and they cross paths and both change direction at the same time. I'm like, Oh shit. And I call my buddy over and he's I'm like, look, look. And they're like, Reed, are you looking for UFOs again? And I'm like, looking? They're right there, motherfucker. And all of a sudden, 30 people look up, and there's six of them flying like in a, a formation like this. And this is in space, dude. These are like satellite level. High flying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. High altitude. And everybody's sitting there going, holy shit. What? what? And they get on the horn, and they call the bridge, and the bridge calls NORTHCOM. We call the Air Force. And the Air Force is like, we're not tracking anything. We're not monitoring them. Then they come back and say, oh, oh, we got something. And that's the last we hear of that from the bridge. And um, so basically these things take off. They all separated, went different directions. December 31st, 2007, I'm pretty sure if you search San Diego to, uh, uh, New Year's Eve UFOs, you'll find out what I'm talking about. Is multiple Because there was multiple witnesses. Multiple witnesses saw six UFOs flying in formation over San Diego that New Year's Eve, just three days later. After you had already had that experience. After a ago. whole bunch of us had that experience. Yeah. Wow. Well, as you're telling that story, that's amazing. I love this. Shit. Why do I love this shit, Josh? Why do you love this shit? Why are some people terrified of this? And some people just like, I can't get enough of this stuff. It's just amazing. Something wrong with me. I don't know, but I'm curious as a cat. And I, you know, I also have had a few of my own experiences. There's one I will never tell um, that's mine. And then there's definitely one that I had that was a, I had a, a, somebody watch it with me. And it's similar to what you were saying about the high flying stuff that you see. And I track, I, I look out, I'm in a beautiful place kind of out of the city. So I don't have much light pollution. So I, I watch the star. I'm like you, I can't stop looking up. Uh, I love watching that stuff. And there's some weird things that I'll see from time to time, but there's one that, it's burned into my memory. I even remember the smell of the air of that night. I was, uh, my wife and I went to a, fr it was, I was teaching in Toronto. It was a martial arts school that I had there. And one of my students, uh, we became pretty tight, him and his wife. And my, we went over and he's like, Hey, I got a nice cottage up North. Why don't you come up? 
So it was like an hour and a half drive. We go up north out of Toronto and uh, we get out. In order to get to his little cabin, we had to take a boat across to get to it. So we take the boat. Evening starting to come in. He got a bunch of other people that we're going to meet. So it ended up just being basically this like play people playing cards, start a fire, drink in a little bit. I had not had a, I didn't drink or anything at that point yet in the evening. I just kind of gotten there. And there was a, mo- I, I often will do this. I just kind of, when there's a lot of hustle and bustle, I, I start to get sick of it after a while and I just need mm-hmm. to kind of get some air. So I just kind of went out the back and I knew I would get a golden shot of the stars because it was, again, no light pollution out on a, some uh, country uh, place. And I go outside and I'm looking around, look at the stars. And I was just blown away by, you could see globs of stars. It wasn't just like a couple little dots that you'd see in the city. We're like, oh, there's five stars. It was like globs of light. It was just amazing. And I was just sitting there taking it in. And I'm, I, I remember starting to get fixated on this one star that was stationary. And it was mm-hmm. at the height of a star. That's how I looked at it. I'm like, wow, look at that star. It's just sitting there. And I look up. I'm sitting there looking at it. I was just blown away by it. And then it moved. And I'm thinking, weird. I've been looking at it for maybe four minutes. Just and they're looking wow, at you. Look at that star. And then it's it was friend from a stationary position to moving. And I'm thinking immediately. My brain is like, what the hell is this? It's got to be a satellite. But wait, they don't stop and then move. And I'm like, okay, I, I don't even know what it is. And then I see it move. To, it moves, and it starts to form the pattern of a square. Like it just kind of goes like this, like it does a square mm-hmm. in front of my eyes and then it just fades. And I'm like, what the hell am I seeing? It blinks back on in a slightly, like just a little bit towards my left. And it does the same thing in reverse, the exact same square pattern in reverse. I'm going, that's no satellite I know of. And because of the height, it was happening fairly quick. So whatever this was thinking about the height calculation, <laughs> that was fast, you know? And then my buddy comes out and this guy, just a great guy. He only knew me as like the martial art guy. I was the sensei, right? He didn't know any of the stuff that I was into my secret research of this stuff. And so he came out and he's like, Hey man, what's up? You okay? And I'm like, dude, I'm just taking in the stars. And what the hell is that? Are you seeing it? Is it me? So he's just sitting there with his beard, like, oh, so he watches and we watch this thing do the exact same pattern like three times. And he's like, I look at him. I'm like, okay, do the checklist with me, bro. Satellite, high flying airplane. Uh, And we just start going through and I'm the one that was more accepting of the fact that we're looking at maybe some back, I don't know, some advanced technology we don't know about, but he's sitting there going like his face was white. His face was like, because this is out of his spectrum of thought. And, and I'm sitting there going, what? That's a fucking UFO. So we go back in. The guy was quiet the rest of the night. So it affected him to that point. Yeah. And that was to me like, okay, it was something that I'm not saying it was ET. I'm just saying it's something that you just don't see. It's not, that's not conventional aircraft by any stretch of imagination. And it looked like it was performing just for me. And I'm like, how is that possible? So that was one of my UFO stories. I've got a couple, but um, I know some people very close to me that had even more. Dude, we could do a whole show on this, but there's a lot of stories that you start to look and you go, when you put stories of like Carl Wolf, all the stuff, the ancient stories, it's when you put it all together that a big picture emerges. If you look at each thing in isolation, these little debunkers and whatever can try to pick fun and do all this stuff all they want. It's when you put it all on the table, man, that you suddenly go, Look, for your paradigm to survive, every single account has to be bullshit. Whereas for me, I only need one monument on Mars to not be natural. I only need one aspect of the moon that isn't natural to come true. I only need one of these stories, whether it's your story or my story or someone else's story or Bob Lazar's story or anybody else. Only one has to be proven for the whole of science and history and religion to be rewritten. Isn't that amazing? That's well said. That's the truth. Well, Josh, dude, we've already gone. We did better this time. Two two hours, 23 minutes. I don't want to do much longer for this one. I think we covered a lot. I hope everybody enjoyed this. What should we do next time? I think we should try to get a guest if we can for for episode three. 
let's try to get a guest. If we can't get a guest, then um, we can continue this conversation of investigating Mars, the moon, the earth, ancient civilizations, and the pretext of aliens. Uh, we could even probably get, uh, I might have a guest in mind that I know would, would come on. So, Okay. Well, let's, let's, let's shuffle the deck, see what we can do. We've got guys, we want to keep this going. I, I am so pumped. This was an awesome episode. Thank you, this Josh. You're the yeah, best man. guy to do this with. Go follow redpills.tv. You can find my work at dwtruthware.com. We're both on all the ro rebel um, social media platforms. And are we also, are we on YouTube right now? We are. We're on the, We've two, our two YouTube channels. Yeah. Sweet. We survived on YouTube. So shout and, out to everybody. And we'll have a YouTube it. channel coming up here soon, as well as a website. The Mars Chronicles will be launching here in the next few days. Everything will be linked up because um, I don't think this is going to be a two or three episode thing. So, No, man. Everybody's emailing me about it. People are want to talk about this. So I think everybody's sick of talking about COVID. So let's I just know. keep talking about Mars and the Moon, man. This is so let's awesome. Cool, man. Thank you, Josh. Thanks to everybody. Okay. Thanks to all the people, Foxhole, DLive, Twitch, Rockfin, YouTube, all the great people. We'll catch you back here real soon. Stay tuned, and I'll catch you later. Cheers.